We are live, yes. So, welcome to O5's Red Eye Review and Thoughts film. Now, I realize this video is long. If you're only interested in the review, not it's not the entire video. If you want to know exactly, usually I say that it's a short part of the video, but that's no longer the case. If you only want to watch the review, you know, you can see how long the review is in the time codes in the description box. Now, so yeah, I started this video with a review where if I spoil anything, I will verbally warn before I do so and hold up an index finger until I'm done with the spoilers. You can mute and skip ahead, which is to see me lower my index finger. Once I end the review itself and get into the thought section, please note the rest of the video will have lots of spoilers, including discussing the ending. I will no longer be warning. I will only be warning if I spoil something other than this movie. And let's see. Now. Yeah, I'm aware that there are probably not that many people who still care about this movie. It came out 16 years ago. I care about it. I want to talk about it. And hence the video. And let's see. Yes, so. I've only watched the theatrical cut. I'm told there is a version that aired on ABC where they had to put some scenes back, or, yeah, they had, according to Wes Craven, it was difficult to even find stuff to put in. I haven't watched that one, so I can't talk about if it's worth watching, but I can definitely recommend the theatrical cut. I first watched this in 2010, and I have watched this, I'm not 100% certain, but somewhere between four times and seven times. And yeah, so plot. Lisa Reisert works at a luxury hotel. She has some managerial powers. I, I'm sorry, they, they might have said her specific title at some point, I, and I, I missed it. She has a fear of flying, which is, yeah, this movie isn't doing that, her, her fear of flying, any favors. On an otherwise routine flight, she's going home after having buried her grandmother, her mother's mother. Her mother and father are divorced. Her mother moved back home to Texas. So she, you know, her father lives in Miami, and I, does she live in the same house? I, I'm, I'm not 100% certain if it's exactly, but yeah, you know, she's flying to Miami, and she's going to go see her father. And in the airport, she has a kind of flirtatious encounter with a young man named Jackson, fairly, you know, attractive. And when she boards the plane, it's, I'm straight, I'm not blind. She finds that he's seated next to her, and once the plane takes off, he starts threatening her, that he will have someone kill her father. And the killer is already very close to her father and ready to kill him. And Jackson proves this by handing her her father's wallet, which the, the assassin stole off his, the, the father's ah, desk table. I guess it's a good thing that the father didn't respond to his missing... He, he notices that his wallet is missing, and he doesn't, like, call the cops or something, because that would kind of mess up the assassin plan, but this is not the most order-type plan in the world. Anyway, yeah, Jackson hands Lisa her father's wallet, and it's easy to recognize because it has been monogrammed. Yeah, evidently it's going to have a baby. Uh, congratulations. Please don't kill anybody at the general reveal party. Forever it's worth. I wrote that joke before the 3rd of April. And yeah, the, the hired kill gave, you know, basically sent, you know, I guess really, really fast shipping. Since I love this movie, but I'm, I'm not saying it's flawlessly written. Honestly, the moment that she realized that her father was played by Brian Cox and the movie came out in the early to mid-2000s, she should have known she was in trouble. If she doesn't call the hotel and make sure that the deputy secretary of the Department of Homeland Security changes rooms at the hotel, which will allow his team to kill the, yeah, DHS, acting secretary, yeah, she's, he's going to have his assassin kill 
or, or rather, actually, yeah, if he doesn't call off the assassin, the assassin is going to kill the father just in case. So even if Lisa, like, tries to get, you know, some someone to deal with Jackson, well, the killer's going to kill her father. Basically, if she does move the, the room, the DHS head is going to be moved into the penthouse. Sweet! You know, Lisa's like, this sure ain't no e-ticket, think I'll tell him where to stick it. Now, off topic, since we are still dealing with Corona, I want to say, during this video, it is possible that I will touch my face. I want to assure you, I washed my hands carefully since the last time I was outside, and I will wash my hands again carefully before going out. Now, if this is something you've never heard of, this is a psychological thriller. It's not a horror movie, despite Wes Craven and, you know, the title also maybe makes it, and the trailer and the cover. It was released in 2005, directed by Wes Craven, R.I.P. And a few days ago, I rewatched his two Nightmare on Elm Street movies and the commentary track of the first one. I meant to listen to the other one, but ran out of time. Those are two of the most terrifying movies ever made. But yeah, I wanted to compare how he handles these two different approaches to tension, suspense, and scaring people. And no, I'm not saying that his two Nightmare on Elm Street movies are better than movies 2, 3, and 4, but I'm not going to get into that in this video. Consider the quality nosedive of George Romero, R.I.P. movies from around the same time, it's a relief to see that Wes Craven was still making good movies, although apparently not all of them. I haven't watched what's it called Cursed. But I'm sorry, this movie is way better than... Diary of the Dead, Land of the Dead. I never have got... I, there's like two more, I think. I haven't gotten around to watching those, but... I mean, Diaz Deacon says that... Let's see, what is it? Survival of the Dead or something. That one's apparently a lot better than you might think, but... I mean... George Romero, he... I love the... the let's see, I guess it's called the... Trilogy of the Dead, I think it's called. Yeah, the, the original trilogy is amazing. Anyway, so the concept here is a sort of post-9-11 Hitchcock Strangers on a Train and or Saboteur, but on a plane. I haven't watched every Wes Craven movie, but I'm not sure he had made anything, you know, very Hitchcockian before this, and he does incredibly well with this. I'm aware not everybody agrees with me on that. A lot of people have a fear of flying, and you never do know if the person sitting next to you is going to say something or do something that's really going to freak you out. And what are you going to do? Force, you know, have them land the plane so you can get away, you know, you're, you're stuck with this person next to you for hours. And no, it's not very likely that the person you're going to be st stuck next to for the duration of the flight is going to threaten to have your father killed. But you got to admit, it is kind of like... It's, it's just taking that, we're already uncomfortable with sitting next to strangers on play. Like, at least if you're in a train, there's some chance that you could, you, know, you could, you could like get up and walk around. Or if it's not hugely crowded, maybe you can find another place to sit if the person you're sitting next to is creeping out. You can't do that on a plane. Other movies do get some good tension out of a hijacking or a gremlin on the wing. And... Yeah, it's very much trying to, you know, kind of play with people's anxieties over flying since 9-11. I don't think, I, I don't know any movie that's, I've, I've, I know movies that are somewhat similar to this, but the thing with it being on a plane, you know, I, yes, I'm aware of Flight Plan. I remember liking that movie, I haven't watched more than once, and that was like 15 years ago or something, so I don't remember it, I'm sorry. I, I might try to watch it again, but that movie is not quite the same as this, you know. But but yeah, it was one of those things where studios, you know, let's, let's see, other examples include Stripsies and Showgirls, you've got Ants and A Bug's Life, you know, sometimes two dueling rivalry studios will put out very similar movies around the same time. But yeah, um, you know, and some people compared it to Speed and such, but yeah. This is one of the only ones I know of where it's on a plane, and it does have some differences from Flight Plan. You know, as it, yeah, it's not a spoiler, it's the core conceit of Flight Plan is that she got on this plane with her kid, and suddenly her kid is missing, and people around her are like, what are you talking about? I, you didn't have a kid when you got on this plane. I saw you 
there was no kid. You know, that's also a really interesting concept, but it's not the same as being having your father threatened if you don't make a really important phone call. You know, I definitely think this was well worth making, and I mean, other than Saboteur, which obviously for those who don't know, it's from like. 42 or something. It's an amazing movie. I'm not I'm not visiting Saboteur, but I'm saying obviously did not comment on post 9-11 flying. I, th you know, other than Saboteur, I think the movie most similar to this might be either Flight Plan or Phone Booth. And I would definitely say that this movie, this does have some things that those do not, but yeah. It's been a long time since I watched Phone Booth, but I remember loving that movie. I, I might try to watch that again and do a video on it. So, yeah, I already have said some critical things of this, and I'm going to keep saying some more critical, but I love this movie. This is, I, I, and I don't, I'm, you know, unabashedly, unashamedly, I love this movie. I, okay, to be fair, I, I was gonna say otherwise I wouldn't have watched it that many times, and, you know, it's, it's at least four times in 11 years possibly seven times in 11 years. Actually, I think the very last, I watched it just before recording this video, but before that, I think it was only a few months ago that I last watched it, and before that, I don't, I'm not sure it had even been a year since the last time I watched it before that, so, now, yeah, so, IMDB has the more like this list, and it compares it to Flight Plan, which I gave a 7, Phone Booth 8, Panic Room 7, so yeah, it's been a while since I watched those, I remember all three as being pretty good. I'm not sure why speed isn't on this list, but there's definitely some resemblance, excuse me, between this and that. The the big difference is speed really is more of a like one of the one of the big things of this movie is Lisa kind of has to if if she draws too much attention, you know, the assassin's gonna kill her father, you know, so she has to try to find some way to to you know, yeah, and Speed, you know, you, you probably watched it, I'm not sure I know of a single person who hasn't, the, the, yeah, it's not a spoiler, that movie is in fact about a bus that has to keep its speed at a certain, I, I forget exactly, but a certain amount of miles per hour, if it slows down, it's going to explode, that's a bit of a different concept from you know, trying to trying to keep a low profile while on the plane, and uh, yeah. Now, but but yeah. So, my personal favorite movie that is like this is this movie. But yeah, I I remember all those others. If it's in in some ways, it is very much like Panic, it, you know, Panic Room, but on a plane. But then I guess Flight Plan might be even closer to Panic Room on a plane. But yeah. Yeah, the, the title has some special significance. The flight that the movie is about is a red-eye flight. So basically they're using the fact that red-eye is already two words that people don't like to hear together, you know. Eyes are great, they help us see. Red is great, but red-eye is, uh, yeah. And one of the trailers makes this very literal by having Killian Murphy's eyes turn red, which... That's not, that's a, that's a very, that's not in the movie. That's, I, yeah, that, that has nothing to do with, with this movie, but it is kind of a difficult movie to make it. It's, I think if that's, is that just the teaser and the other trailer gives a little bit too much away because it's very difficult to advertise this movie without giving too much away or just like, yeah. So moving on, I decided to review this because I am very impressed that they managed to make this work, and I think that deserves notice. The original reason I bought this, other than the fact that it was on sale, was because I loved Scream 1 and 4 and Nightmare on Elm Street 1 and 7, so I wanted to see more Wes Craven horror movies. I've never been disappointed that this movie was very good. I think I always knew that it was very Hitchcockian, and Hitchcock is one of my favorite directors. <laughs> Despite, I'm aware that he's done some stuff that's, uh, but yeah, and, and, you know, Scream 2 and 3, if I'm already watching 1 and 4, I'm, I'm 100% okay with binging all four. 
and yeah, so talking about like kind of sub-genres, this is the kind of thing where, you know, you're trapped in a confined space for a long time in danger. It's a very good entry into a subgenre that's difficult to do right on account of the confined space. Terror on a Plane, pretty good entry. Kidnapped, which, you know, it's, the movie, it's sort of this middle ground between a kidnapping and a hostage situation. But yeah, good entry. Strong female lead, also good entry. But yeah, the, the fact that, I mean, really, this is, like, so much of the movie is Jackson trying to convince Lisa to make the call, and Lisa trying to find ways to get out of it, tricking Jackson or, or something. And it just, on paper, this should not work. On paper, this movie should never work, not, for, not at all. The moment that they get on the plane, the movie should just be completely... Just, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? The, it's, it's a crap airplane, so you have... It's very difficult to film there. It's two people talking. You know, how, how can that be incredibly tense and suspenseful and thrilling? But it is. It's, and and it's, a, it's a credit to the, the script, the actors, and Wes Craven's direction. It's, it's, and the editing. It, just incredible. Now, let's see, the, I'm not saying that all of Wes Craven's movies are equally good, some of them are bad, I'm told, I haven't watched Cursed, I haven't seen a bad movie directed by him, I think he also, did he do like a musical or a drama or something around like 99, I haven't watched that one, I, I'm told it's bad. It is pretty impressive that Wes Craven put out movies in the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s, and 2010s, you know, he managed, like, again, I'm not saying all these movies are equally good, but he did manage to keep up with different, like, different expectations from, you know, for, for horror movies. He, he made horror movies in all of these decades. So, yeah. And, yeah, so, like I mentioned, I rewatched the, the West Craven's Two Nightmare on Street. I guess for, yeah, uh, I guess not everybody knows what that means. Uh, Wes Craven directed the first and the seventh and final, other than the remake, which is terrible, of the, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies or Freddy Krueger films. But yeah, in, in his two Nightmare on Elm Street movies, a lot of the time the thing that scares us is something we hear. A lot of the time it's something we can't even see. The, the scares always use sound or sometimes the complete lack of sound. And part of what makes it scary is the disempowerment, the fact that they can't avoid the situation. You know, if they go to sleep, Freddy Krueger will kill them. In this situation, in this movie, the situation that, you know, staying on the plane next to Jackson, you know, what, yeah, what is she going to do? If she, like, literally, the moment that he says, I'm going to kill your father, she presses the, uh, what's it called? He call stewardess button. And by the, you know, before the steward, you know, the steward is like, I'm, I'm going to be there in just, just a second. Okay. And, you know, the 30 seconds or so it takes the steward. You know, she's got a lot of stuff to do. She has many jobs. In the time it takes the stewardess to get to Lisa, Jackson has convinced her. You know, he's, yeah, he, he just points out, if the plane lands somewhere it's not supposed to, my assassin will kill your father. If... The you know if if you some if you somehow prevent me from calling him, he will kill your father. So you know. And and whether we're talking so, so yeah, just real quick, this movie the the, it's it's not really the the, it's not so much sounds and. Not quite being able to see the the dangerous thing that's that's scaring us. So it is. It is a very different way of handling scary movies. And whether we're talking Red Eye, Nightmare on Elm Street 1 and 7, or Scream, sorry, Scream 1, there's the, the theme of the young woman's father being in danger or trying to protect her or the like. So that is, you know, something that, it's, it's a theme that he brings up in a number of his movies. I'm not saying this is the best movie Wes Craven directed, but of all the movies I've seen that he directed, it is one of the most 
this should not work anywhere near as well as it does. And it's incredibly effective, despite how limited it is. I mean, his Nightmare on Elm Street movies and Scream movies don't really feel like they're limited. They basically feel like, you know, Freddy Krueger could get you anywhere. The, the uh, ghost face could get you anywhere. But this, they're sitting on a plane for a long time and, and talking. It's, it's unreal how well it works. And again, like, you know, the, the reason, of, some of the reasons that it works so well are the same reasons that Panic Room, Speed, Flight Plan, and Phone Booth work so well. Acting, writing, directing, filming, editing. Once again, these are these movies are different from each other, but they they all have they impose certain limitations upon the movie. And yeah, and and Wes Craven's Nightmare on Elm Street movies get a lot of mileage out of Freddy Krueger's tongue, and this movie gets a lot of mileage out of Killian Murphy's eyes. And where Wes Craven, you know, in the Wes Craven movies, not the later ones. Freddy Krueger's face is almost never seen and frequently in shadow. Killian Murphy's face is from, featured prominently and well lit throughout. Like, if this was, you know, the, the early part and, and the, the trailers make it, at, at first, make it seem like it's a romantic comedy. And honestly, if it was a romantic comedy, his face would be seen as much as it is in this thriller where he is the, excuse me, he is the person threatening to, to kill or threatening to have someone killed, I suppose. This is one of those movies where they really badly wanted to arrive at the central concept, so the writing has to make some leaps in logic in service of that. I think they do a decent job of explaining it away, but it is the kind of thing that would probably not happen in the real world, so if that is something that bothers you, it might bother you in this movie. I, you know, several of the... I, I read about as many reviews as I could find. Several of them just straight up say this would never happen in real life. I could not suspend my disbelief. I did not like this movie. And that's fair. You know, it's it's not the kind of... Yeah. I've seen some people say that Lisa should simply yell out that Jax is Harris, that that would solve the problem, they say. They say that that would solve the problem. But if Lisa simply did that, then the assassin near her father is going to kill her father. Now, let's see. I think, yeah, just real quick, spoiler for the ending of this movie. Near the end, once she is off the plane, the reason she doesn't, you know, she, she personally rushes to her father's house instead of talking to the cops is that if she talks to the cops, they're going to ask her some questions. She can't just leave immediately. And again, then the assassin will kill her father. No more spoilers for the time being. This was written by Dan Foos, who hasn't written anything else, and Carl Ellsworth. Carl Ellsworth wrote two episodes of Xena, and, I mean, some people say that this sh this is basically like a really long episode of, for example, Twilight Zone, or it's too much like a TV show episode. I love movies. There are a lot more movies that I love than TV shows and TV show episodes, so I think it would really bother me if it did feel like that. But I can definitely see how, I mean episodes of TV shows, it is, it again, it stays in the plane for a long time, and that is the kind of thing where, you know, yeah, if you have to do, like, a, a two-parter, then maybe the characters have to stay in the same place for a really long time, and you have to make up reasons for why they can't leave or don't leave, and stuff still has to happen in there, and, yeah, I think if he had, if he was known for writing movies, if he hadn't written any TV, I'm, I'm not sure he could have done as well as he did with this, but it doesn't feel like TV. It, it feels like he's taking some aspects of a TV show and putting them in a movie script. It doesn't feel like it is. I mean, it's set on a plane. It's not cheap to film on a, on a plane, you know. Anyway. And, yeah, so... The... Yeah, the other things that the... Yeah, so these are the things... This is the only thing I've watched that he, you know, this and the episodes of Xena are the only things he wrote that I watched. But the things they're known for other than this are Disturbia, which is also fairly, you know, it's again, it, it has, it imposes some limitations on itself. The Last House on the Left remake and the Red Dawn remake. 
I think Last House on the Left, I think the Last House on the Left remake was after this movie, so it is kind of interesting that they went from the, and I'm not sure that Wes Craven had anything to do with that movie, so, but I guess they were like, you made it, you wrote a good script for a Wes Craven movie, let's see if you can do it for a Wes Craven remake. The, hmm. Right, yeah, just brief spoilers for this movie. I personally love that this movie handles it the way it does. That's not a spoiler by itself. I do think that there is also a cool movie and a very similar concept for the lead is moving around the plane as it's flying, but then that might be the movie Flight Plane. I only watched it once, so, you know, it's been years since I watched it, maybe a decade or more, so I can't remember what it is. No more spoilers for this movie for the time being. I, th I would say that the writers fully realized how to make what they were working on work well. You know, it's, it's, it's very tight. There's no, like, the, the dialogue just doesn't just go on and on. There's constantly shifts and turns in the dialogue. And it's not repetitive despite the concept. It's, I, if, if you actually, yeah, so the, before I first watched this, someone did describe parts of this movie to me, and they were like, it's, it kind of, it's, I think it sounds repetitive when I explain it, and I was like, kind of does, yeah. But then when I watched it, I was actually super into it. And, let's see. But yeah, you know, so, so as far as credibility goes, you do have to accept some of these leaps in logic. Because this, you know, they wanted the concept to be this very specific thing, where realistically it wouldn't work out like that, so... And, let's see, yeah, it's a concept that needs a lot of explaining before you're willing to accept it. You know, so yeah, it, it seems like there should be a ton of different ways to easily resolve the threat. But it does a good job explaining. Basically, the writer sat down, thought of all the possible easy solutions, came up with reasons why they wouldn't work. Why can't Lisa just yell out for people to subdue Jack, the guy threatening her father? Because the assassin, who's currently so close that her father to her father that he can't see him, sorry, that the assassin can see his father, her father with his own eyes, her, his father with her own eyes, if he doesn't hear from Jackson, he will assume that Jackson has been stopped, will kill the father. Why doesn't Lisa call her father and warn him, or maybe call the police and tell them about the assassins? Because Jackson is watching her and monitoring everything she does constantly. Why doesn't she try to secretly communicate with someone on the plane? Let's just say that maybe she will, and if so, the movie would show what happens. And, yeah, so, you know, like, she actually, like, be, right after the threat, right after Jackson threatens her, say, says that the killer is right there by her father, and proves it with, you know, showing her the mold, she's like, I want to talk to my father before I make the call you want me to make. And he's like, okay, fine. And, yeah, you know, so it is... Because really, you know, if she sees the wallet, that's not proof that he's still alive. You know, so it, it would probably be easier to take his wallet if he were already dead. But, you know, he's the kind of person who leaves the wallet. I mean, he's at home. He's at home. He leaves the wallet on a, on a table that he's not paying close attention to. A again, like, if, if the guy couldn't have gotten a hold of the wallet, I mean, I guess, hypothetically, he could, like, kidnap the father and keep him prisoner and then... But yeah, the the they wanted this very specific concept, and I think they did a really good job. The movie handles plot plot twists well. There are not too many or too few; it's the right amount, and it's not difficult to keep up with the twists. I some people have predicted them. I've shown this movie to friends of mine; they didn't predict them. So, and I'd like to think I have smart friends. So. Let's see, and yeah, I mean, it really, it really sucks that Wes Craven died. I'm, I'm really glad he got to make as many movies as he did because he clearly had a lot to say. It's not like he just made the same movie over and over. And the, yeah, you know, the, the, I, I would have loved to, maybe I will try to track down his, um, uh, Scaredy. Scaredy Matt of the Scaredy Cats YouTube channel did a review of, what was it called, The People Under the Stairs, 
where he talked about, you know, people kind of expect it to be this, and I thought it was going to be that, but nope, it's actually this instead, so I might have to watch that movie. That's, uh, yeah. Now, let's see, and, and yeah, like, if the, I, I would love to watch other stuff by the writers as well. Although I do hear that the Last House on the Left remake isn't that good, and I've heard the Dawn of the Dead, sorry, the Dawn of, the Dawn of the Red, Red Dawn, is apparently terrible. This movie and remake are apparently terrible. The direction is very focused. And yeah, so these are the other movies Wes Craven has directed that I have watched. All four Scream movies and yeah, both of the, the Nightmare on Elm Street movies. I know, I know. Everybody tells me I gotta watch the original. Last House on the Left. I'd like to. I haven't found it on uh, I haven't found a deal. That's it. And yeah, you know, the, the things he's most known for are Scream, Nightmare on Elm Street, Last House on the Left, and The Hills of Eyes with the Sound of Music. And I haven't watched those either. I have been waiting for a way to work that joke into one of my videos for longer than I should admit. I, ju I just think it's funny to, to sub you know, the hills are alive or the hills have eyes with the sound of music, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm a really big fan of his work as a director and I would say he completely understood how to make this work and he chose to work on it and it really shows. Unless someone, you know, really, unless someone tells you before you start watching or you look it up or something, you really don't know what kind of horror movie you're getting when you start watching a Wes Craven horror movie. You know, Last House on the Left, I know some about it. It's very different from some of these other movies, you know. And, and, and you know, Hills Have Eyes also, different, yeah. There, there are things that they have in common, but they're not just the same. I'm really glad that this is not the only movie where Killian Murphy plays a sociopath, or where Rachel McAdams plays a strong female character, because they're incredibly good at it. Excuse me. So, I'm... Yeah, so the opening... The very start does a great job at establishing Lisa. She's smart, she thinks on her feet, she's good at solving problems by combining her wits with what her job allows her to do. So, you know, she works with what she has. She's not, like, whining about, why can't I... That's not a... I'm not... I would say... I, I would use the word whining, even though if I was talking about a male character as well. The... the she doesn't she doesn't obsess over, oh, but it would be so much easier if I had this and this and this. No, she's like, well, this is all I have. I'll work with it. Most of the time, she's just making sure that the people checked into the luxury hotel are happy, even if, for example, their reservation got deleted or something. From right away, we can tell that she's not going to just give in to demand. She's going to try to think her way out of it. The first few minutes show a lot of things that we don't know right away how they're going to pay off, but we do get the sense that there will be a payoff, and in fact there is. You know, there's a sense of tension, but we don't know what the goal is. A wallet is stolen, a box of frozen fish is opened, and there was something inside, etc. And, you know, the, I already talked about the wallet, but, yeah, you know, the moment when you first see it, you have no idea. It's just, oh, someone stole a wallet. And then a little later, you see the wallet presented to Lisa, and it's like, oh, and instead of the movie having to, you know, backfill, no. We know, we, we know how it got there because we saw it being stolen, we saw it being shipped, and we saw someone open it. We didn't know at the time that that was Jackson, but the moment we see he has the wallet, we know it must have been. I'm not going to give away whether it's a happy ending or a sad ending. I will say that I personally love the ending. Some people love it, some people hate it. I suppose most would find it frustrating if I tried to say I'm just in the middle of that, so I will say... I am much closer to loving it than hating it. If, yeah, if you want to, you know, if I have to give one clear answer, I love it. I love the ending. 
there is there are a few aspects of the ending that I don't particularly care for, but on the whole, I do love it. The ending is one of the most difficult things about a horror movie, with a certain percentage of notable exceptions, and this is not one of those exceptions, but for sure, it resolves everything, and it does so without deus ex machina, other writing crutches, or the like. You 100% understand why the ending happens the way it does, and why it couldn't have happened soon. I will say there are some cliches later in the film, and, and arguably also some early in the film. Some people really hate this movie for the cliches. I'm not going to claim that the cliches are not there, and it would have been nice if they weren't, if they found a new way to excuse me, write solutions to these things, but they had problems to solve, and these were cliches that solved those problems, so yeah. In my personal experience, don't lose interest along the way. For sure, some people do find it frustrating just how contained it is. If you're not sold on the core concept, you might find it to be overly limited. And for sure, if you watch this thinking you're getting Nightmare on Elm Street, Scream, The Hills of Eyes, or, or Last House on the Left, Wes Craven, rather than Wes Craven channeling out for Hitchcock, you're going to be disappointed. Or pleasantly surprised, but yeah. And, yeah, as a tribute to Alfred Hitchcock, this movie does really well. And I, I try to be very critical of those. There are a lot of, like, if you find a movie that's a remake of a Hitchcock movie, it might suck. There are a couple of those that are terrible. Like, do not watch the Rope remake with Sandra Bullock. It is utter garbage, and... There are some real weaknesses to the remake of Rear Window. I do really appreciate that they did actually hire someone who was in a wheelchair to play that role. But other than that, you know, this, yeah, there are a couple of good things about it. But on the whole, it is not a good movie. You know, but movies that are made by directors who are inspired by Hitchcock, you know, spiritual successors to his movies, some of the, you know, this is great, a simple plan is great, so the, yeah, you know, yeah, moving on to the characters, the cast completely understood how to play their roles to really make it work. Some of them are, you know, some of the characters grow and change over the course of the film. Jackson himself is a fairly compelling character. Lisa herself is not necessarily the most, but she is very intelligently written and played. And the yes, you know the the Lisa and Jackson are somewhat interest interesting for the kind of film that it is. And let's see, it's you know it's not a movie full of interesting characters. There are some memorable characters, especially some of the basically extras, like some of the some of the other people on the plane will show up a couple of times in the movie and they're a little memorable and such. And that is, you know, this is a movie that rewards paying attention. Like you'll you'll see you'll you'll meet characters and you'll see character traits. It might be a while before they pay off, but a lot of them pay off. Like it's yeah. Rachel McAdams plays Lisa Reichert. In addition to how smart she is, she's also clearly very caring. One of the first things we see her do is help out Cynthia, the young woman that's doing her job while she's away, who's called her with a crisis, and this is before the plane takes off, before she's even on the plane, and when, you know, Cynthia doesn't know it when she calls, but we've just been told, because, like, the, the taxi was, you know, there's, there's traffic. She has ten minutes to get on the plane. Cynthia calls and says, I have a huge problem. A lot of people would be like, I cannot deal with that right now. Okay, that is not, I have to get on this plane. But no, Lisa's like, let me know what the problem is. I'll see if I, you know, I'll, I'll help find a solution, you know. And yeah, you know, a, a lot of people in this situation would be very anxious, get upset with Cynthia. And, you know, the, the, I mean, both women obviously have to at least briefly entertain the thought 
is it going to be a complete mess while Lisa is away? Are people going to lose their jobs over this? You know, this is this is not like, oh, you know, I I I'm I'm babysitting and I bought vanilla, but the kid says he wants chocolate ice cream. What am I gonna do? No, this is this is a huge deal. You know, they actually right before Cynthia calls Lisa, the the you know, she's dealing with some some guests at this hotel, and one of the guests literally tell her would you get in more trouble if you called Lisa or if I called corporate? And that, yeah, Cynthia might lose her job. And, yeah. But Lisa remains completely calm, figures out exactly how to solve the crisis, and, you know, Cynthia did accidentally delete a reservation, and that is, like, it's a, it's a computer, you know, until you're used to it, you don't, like... And, and again, that's not a, that's not a, I'm not saying that because she's a woman. We all have, the, the first time we deal with computers, we really have to get used to how it works. And this is, like, Cynthia basically hasn't really had to do this by herself before just now, you know. And, and I know, some people say, ah, oh, you know, that it's, why is the person, you know, that, excuse me, why is the, the temp such, you know, so, so inexperienced? Well... The the way I see it, she she basically knows the job, but she's nervous, and because of that, occasionally, you know, may, may yeah, you know, like the the deleting the reservation. I think the idea was that she was like she was gonna like open, you know, she was like using the mouse, she's gonna open the reservation, and then you know she clicks on it and then says reservation deleted or something like that, you know. It, I don't think we're ever really shown exactly what it is. And, like, okay, now she knows not to do that again. But, yeah, like, I think every single person I've met in my life has at some point accidentally messed something up with a computer. And, yeah, Killian Murphy plays Jackson Rickner. Yeah, that's right. His name is Jackson Rickner, and apparently, like, he, he says that he hasn't gone by jack since he was a child so i don't i guess maybe the school children called him jack the ripper or something i really wish they had given him a less ridiculous name i think it's basically lampshading you know like give him the name of a killer so that the obvious instinct of whether or not he might be a killer a lot of men don't realize for a lot of women when they meet a man they immediately try to figure out if he's a killer or rapist or such if they need to get to safety you know so yeah when 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 Lisa meets him and thinks, is this guy a killer? And he says, oh yeah, I'm Jack the Ripper. You know, it's like, uh, <laughs> okay, no way. It's, yeah, that's ridiculous. It's, you know, a, a, an actual killer would have changed his name. You know, if, if he was going around killing one woman after another, he's not going to, he's not going to call himself Jack the Ripper. You know, that's, uh, yeah. It's one of the only bad things about the movie. I think they could have given him that basic thing, but make it a lot less on the nose, give him a less a, a name less ridiculous. But you know, I, I did see, you know, some someone, one of the one of the critics said that, you know, he is threatening this young woman, and there is this sort of, like, it, it you know, it, we are supposed to think of him as a threat to young women. I love this movie, and I love Batman Begins, and I have a lot of admiration for Wes Craven and Christopher Nolan, but I don't know what made either of them, or whoever made the decision to write recommend it to them, while watching the excellent movie 28 Days Later, look at Killian Murphy and say, I want that guy to play a sociopath in my movie. To be fair, when he, audi when he auditioned for Batman Begins, he was auditioning for the role of Batman. And, you know, if you watch some of some of the foot, I mean, he tried, you know, he's incredibly talented. I don't think he would have been quite right as Batman. But, yeah, you know, they were like, I mean, you're talented and those eyes. OK, do you would you mind playing Scarecrow instead? And, uh, you know, I get it. His face, his his cheekbones and the those piercing blue eyes do work incredibly well for a chilling role. And, but, but yeah, just real quick, I mean, if you watch 28 Days Later, which you should, because it's an amazing movie, 
there is nothing in its performance in that movie that makes you think, you know, Scarecrow or, or Jackson Rickner in this movie. His eyes and calm demeanor make him so much scarier than a lot of movie villains that are nowhere near as calm. And somehow, at times, his character actually seems to really empathize with his... Uh, it, it's, it's really, really creepy. You know, that they could have made him, like, you know, like this, you know, he could have been, like, let's see, what's a, what's a good example of, like, uh, they, yeah, it could have been, like, I'm, I'm not, it's been ages since I watched the, the Dracula movie, but Francis Ford Coppola directed, but you know, if you watch that movie, some of the time, Gary Oldman's performance in that, you know, like when he says, I never drink wine, they could have had Jackson Ripner play like that, but it wouldn't have worked as well. You know, he could have been like, let's see, what's that? I'm thinking, I think I'm thinking, of, right, right, uh, Man in Black 2. You know, that, that guy that grabs Selena and like puts a knife to her face and like licks her cheek or something. But it wouldn't have been as creepy. Somehow, it is even creepier that he's sitting here and he's actually kind of... Oh. Oh, wow. Now I understand why you're upset. Oh, man. But if you don't call the hotel... I am going to have someone kill your father. It's just... the the Oh, it's so creepy. It's so unbelievably creepy. It's It's perfect. It's absolutely perfect. Not to mention the fact that it's extremely difficult not to like a character who openly mocks the words of Dr. Phil. At the very earliest times we see him, he's treated as an extra by the camera. He's just standing in line behind Lisa. And the way he talks to Lisa is creepy in the way that he's acting like they've known each other for a long time. Like, very frequently, he'll instead of calling her Lisa, he'll call her Lise. Which, you know, it's it's... Like, you know, that's, I mean, on The Simpsons, Bart calls Lisa Lise, you know, but you're not, you're not supposed to, you know, it's, it's just, it's really creepy, you know, he, he doesn't call her Miss Reisert, he doesn't call her Lisa Reisert, he calls her Lise, like they're old friends. And Brian Cox plays Joe Reisert, Lisa's father. He worries much more about her than she feels there's reason to, but it mostly means that he calls her more than she thinks there's reason to. He's a writer, he's very calm, sits at home, watches, oh, let's see, stand-up comedy marathons. They do a good job of making a convincing and making it convincing and compelling, not letting it get to the point of being creepy. You, you know, you really want to see the two reunited, which obviously will not happen if something happens to one of them. You know, I, I recently did a video on The Forgotten, and once again, I don't, I don't think there's something wrong with a parent caring very deeply for a child. But at times in that movie, it does feel creepy. Like, it feels like she's m more attached to her, her kid than she really should be. Like, it, it feels like there's some kind of, like, yeah, it just, it, it feels, it feels excessive. And, you know, that's in part because the, the writer of that movie doesn't, you know, he, he doesn't have as good a sense of making something like that, even as the writers of this. Now, Jema Mays plays Cynthia. She's really nervous and anxious, she isn't actually bad at the job, she's just a little new. She doesn't have that much experience yet. For some reason, some people th seem to think that she's, like, ditzy or stupid. I guess some people can't see an attractive woman having trouble with something and not think that she's ditzy. Like I always said, I, that's really not how I say it. I, I chose to start by saying how I see it, so that that's the first thing that pops into your head when you think of her character, instead of you know, wondering, wait, is she ditzy? Is she stupid? I, it's, it's really telling that some people watch this movie and are like, wow, what an idiot. She does almost everything right. She barely messes anything up. She's mostly just nervous and anxious. I, I think basically the only real mistake she makes is the, the, 
you know, she accidentally deleted the, the reservation. And again, I'm sorry, but if she hasn't had a lot of practice with a computer program, you know, yeah, anyway. If you feel like you've seen her before, she was on Heroes playing a waitress who had a significant role. And let's see, yeah, that's basically the ones that I want to comment on. Now, let's see, the, yeah, so do you as a viewer empathize with or identify with like the protagonist and or antagonists? You, you definitely empathize with, well, a couple of people who reviewed this movie hated Lisa. I don't really understand why, but, you know, their reviews are online. Maybe you can read it and figure out. But yeah, I, th I think most people will really empathize with and identify with and like Lisa. And again, what's wild is that at times you do kind of empathize with Jackson because there are times where he will like just at least once in the movie he straight up says are you okay you know he like at you know sometimes he'll say I well whatever you know suck it up do the do what I told you but other times he will be like are you okay and it's just it's, yeah he's he's a complicated character and I, yeah, you're definitely meant to care, you know, empathize with Lisa. And I think, yeah, if, if you don't care about Lisa, you, you're probably not that invested in the outcome of the story. Because it really does boil down to, you know, what's Jackson going to do to Lisa or her father? And we don't know that much about her father, really. We, I mean, it's the kind of thing where we care about her father she cares about her father you know the and and the and and the DHS acting secretary I mean we barely know anything about him you know he's the the it's it's just that you know I, I mean really hypothetically it almost could have just been that they want to blow up a specific building but that isn't quite as emotional and then you know if if you if Lisa has to call someone, it makes sense for that to be so that she can move, you know, the the DHS guy from one room to another room, and yeah, and yeah, I you know ultimately most people watching, as far as I ever know, was at least empathize with Lisa, so you know that was and and because of that, care more about the movie, and. Everyone does really good acting, and the chemistry between Lisa and Jackson is really good. Like, like I mentioned, you know, early on they're flirting, and like he's fairly forward. She's a little bit guarded, but it, you know, it works. And the you know, you you can believe that they would keep flirting. And after a while, you know, both of them are trying to outsmart the other, and it, yeah, it just like you really get this sense that. They're both intently focused on the other, you know, the, it, it, if the, if you replaced one of the actors and they didn't have chemistry, it would be nowhere near as compelling to watch. And I would say basically everyone is convincing in the role they're given. And yeah, convincing, well cast. There are some, you know, some of the extras do some overacting or underacting, but it, it really bothers some people. It doesn't bother me. I, I would say that a little bit of it is maybe that um, some of these jokes, I don't, I, you know, I haven't read the script, so I don't know if they were there, but Wes Craven kind of directs these jokes like he's still directing something from the 80s or possibly 90s mostly 80s, you know, like there's this joke that apparently, I f uh, was it that we watched a movie YouTube, guys? I, f I forget, but, you know, when when Lisa's getting on onto the plane, you know, she walks, there, there's this kind of overweight guy, and at first he's just like kind of relaxing, and then he sees her, and because she's an attractive woman, he kind of like 
sucks his stomach in and tries to look good. And it's just, I don't think it's a terrible joke, but it, it is played a little bit. Like, it doesn't feel like a joke in a 2005 movie. It feels like a joke in a 1980s movie. You know, it, it's like, it's, yeah. And, yeah, so the, the dialogue, a lot of the time, people in this talk the way they do in real life, especially during these sort of flirting that goes on between Jack and Lisanne Jackson before he reveals his intentions. And they somehow manage to make the outlandish details of the plan smoothly fit into that. And smartly, first, Lisa simply does not believe Jackson because what he describes is so out of the ordinary. It's something you as a normal person would never expect to hear. Like, if you're working with the CIA and interrogating someone, you might hear what he's saying. But as a person who works for a hotel who's taking a plane, she would never expect to hear this. And so she, at first, does not believe him. You know, like, literally, right after he starts saying the, the truth, she's like, okay, fine, you don't, you don't have to tell me the truth, just, it, you're really obviously lying right now, and it's, it's not even really funny, just, I'll stop asking, it's fine, we don't have to talk about, you know, and, and that is, again, something, like, there, there are a number of these movies where there is this outlandish concept, and the movie kind of just, expects you to accept it, you know, that, like, there's just a couple of lines, and then people start acting like characters rather than people in real life, and that can work if the movie isn't supposed to be set in the real world, but a number of, them, of those movies that don't manage to are set in the real world, and this one is set in the real world, and this one gets it. You know, at, at first she doesn't believe him, but then as he proves it, she comes to accept the truth of it, and you can see, like, she's trying to figure out, how can I get out of this? How can I save my father? A lot of the best material of the film is when Lisa and Jackson are on the plane sitting next to each other, talking. Him trying to convince her to make the call, her trying to find a way to avoid it. But yeah, the, the, let's see, yeah, the, the characterization is really well done, and it is this thing of, like, before we see Lisa dealing with Jackson's threats, we're, we, we see her help Cynthia. So, you know, I'm, I, again, Cynthia calls. There's 10 minutes before Lisa has to be on a plane. She only just now arrived at the airport. And Cynthia's like, I think I deleted the reservation. You know, like, this is, this. yeah, you, you think, like, how can she even, how can she even solve this? The guests are standing right in front of Cynthia now. You know, the, the, she, the, you know, the, the, she, yeah. So, so the, you know, it would, it would be one thing, like, they're saying, they're saying, we made these reservations six months ago, you know. It would be one thing if she deleted them months ago and now, you know, and, and then has had time to, to fix, but no, she, you know. And, yeah, you know, so so when you see Lisa really smoothly handle that, you know, it wasn't something you should expect it to happen, but it was, you know, she has, she knows that you have to be, like, she's, they're both worried that these guests are going to complain and get people fired. You know, so the, the, yeah, and, and because she, she handles that so smoothly, yeah, you, you believe it when you see her struggling to, like, this is, again, a, a one of the problems with the movie The Forgotten. You don't know enough about these people, so when they start behaving in really smart ways, you're like, where did that come from? Where in this movie, it's set up. And, and in fact, before we even, before we meet Lisa for, for sure, we see, like, the camera pan, you know, when, when the wallet is stolen, the camera pans across and you see, you know, Lisa in like, you know, the, the, ah, let me get, actually, no, never mind. I think it's another panning shot, but yeah, you know, if you see, you see that, ah, I guess if I start talking about it here, it's going to be, tell you what, spoilers to this movie. You see that she was a cheerleader, which, you know, a fellow reviewer pointed out. So she, she wants to, like, she, ah. She cares about making the unit work together. She's not selfish. You see that, she, I, th I think, was it like hockey or something? Some, some kind of sport. 
So you know she used to be athletic and... Uh, yeah, I'm already spoiling the movie. So the, at the end of the movie, she grabs... I'm not sure if... Is it hockey? Or is it... It's not a baseball bat. It, it's something, you know. But anyway, yeah. No more spoilers for the movie for the time being. And yeah, so the cinematography by was done by Robert Yemen. Yeoman. And let's see, he also, yeah, I haven't watched that many other movies he was DP for. Uh, Royal Tenenbaums, Dogma, Rushmore, and Bottle Rocket. There, there's, there's not a lot of, like, Dolly stuff on the, the plane itself since it was revealed that it was a set. It's mostly straightforward shots. He definitely understood how to make it work. It's not, I'm not sure, is there any handheld? I'm not sure there is. I'm pretty sure there isn't when it's on the plane itself, but when it comes to the chunk of the movie that is set on the plane from the very start to the very end is genuinely convincing. It feels like the movie was shot on a plane flying through the air when in reality none of it, you know, like if you if you know anything about moving, it's, ah, about filming movies, you do not want to film on a flying plane if you can at all avoid it. You know, in, in reality, they had, like, a, a rigged up set that, you know, they, they didn't even have to do the Star Trek acting, you know, the, that, that could simulate, like, turbulence. And then there's just, you know, camera people, you know, yeah. So, so it's, but it, yeah, it feels like it is actually, like, I think I noticed maybe one time where the, the, camera made a movement where it's like it would not be able to do that in a real plane but other than that yeah and and it really like you kind of have to remind yourself that it's a set because logically we know it has to be there's no i i'm not sure there's ever been a movie filmed on a flying plane or i'm i'm i would i would guess no mainstream movie has and certainly if any of it was, it was very, very little of it. And yeah, like the, the, it's, it's, ah, one thing. excuse me. It's completely convincing, you know, you, you really have to sort of remind yourself that it's a set. Anyway, it's very claustrophobic. It feels like you and the characters are trapped in the plane. And, yeah, in this, like in Wes Craven's two Nightmare on the Street movies, he likes using these panning shots, sometimes very long, to start some scenes, to communicate information to the audience wordlessly. He likes having the camera either start far away and gradually close in, or start close and then slowly pull back, and he uses it to great effect in those two movies and in this one. And... Wes Craven likes uh, having female leads in his horror movies that fight back despite their fear. They're smart and driven. And Wes Craven clearly has empathy, excuse me, for, uh, you know, in, in, yeah, in the movies where his leads are teenagers, he has empathy for them, you know, how they experience that their parents don't really listen to them. And let's see. And, and you know, in, in this movie... Or, or, yeah, be believe them when they tell them something. In this movie, Lisa is treated badly by some of the people who she has to deal with in her work for the hotel, and we're encouraged to see her as a human being when a lot of people really don't treat service industry employees as human beings. You know, they see them as just, you know, I, I pay money, and I'm supposed to get something incredible that's worth the value of that money, and you're just a vessel. You just get me from point A to point B, you know, and they forget that they're people. Please treat, excuse me, treat service industry employees well. They deserve it. They happen, excuse me, they work extremely hard. Now, the editor, yeah, so these are the other things. Yes, Patrick L Lussier, this is everything that I have seen him edit. Bloody about, I'm sorry. My Bloody Valentine, the 2009 one. The Eye, the... The 
Jessica Alba remake. I already, I also watched the original one, okay? I didn't jump to the Jessica Alba one. I watched it. it there was a sale on the, the, the first movie, its remake, and the second movie, and so I watched all three of them. And no, this American, I'm guessing, did not edit the uh, Japanese, I want to say. I know that not all Asian horror is Japanese. Anyway, uh, uh, Jack Bloods 2000, Scream 3, how long did this go? 20 years later. Scream 2, Mimic, Scream, and Wes Craven's New Nightmare. And yeah, you know, he understood how to make it work. And yeah, it's just like when when they're when they're flirting, it's this kind of soft, like you you <sighs> is dance the right word? It kind of like the rhythm between them, like it's it's not just that one of them is like really really passionate and the other one's kind of bored. You know they're they're you know back constant back and forth of like you know yeah flirtatious things that that they're saying you know, and then once it's more tense, you know yeah it really it it feels like it just it holds really long on and, and in reality it probably isn't. But it, yeah, it, it works. He completely understood how to make it work. There's the right amount of special effects. A lot of it is just making the interior plane set appear as if it's actually flying through the air, which of course it's not. It would be a nightmare, technically speaking. But you know, yeah, the green screen uh, on on like the the what's it called the the screens and the the windows and such. You know. And the there aren't a lot of stunts, but it, it's the right amount, and they're they're very effective. And yeah, and as far as production design goes, the interior of the plane is incredibly convincing. Like, if you didn't know, like if you showed this per this person, this movie to a person who didn't know that it would you know, that the plane interior would be a set, they, you know, depending, excuse me, depending on how, uh, you know, cynical they are or what, you know, what not, they, you know, some people might actually believe that it was filmed inside a flying plane. And let's see. Yeah, so it's it doesn't have a lot of locations, you know, the airport, the airplane, the interior, the the hotel that Lisa, you know, usually, ah, what's it called? Yeah, you know, the hotel she works at, and Lisa's dad's suburban home. Ah, this one. So yeah, the as far as action goes, you know, most of the movie it's tense and suspenseful. So yeah, quick spoiler for this, there is a little bit of action. No more spoilers for this movie. And yeah, I mean, it's mainly a thriller. It's very much a psychological, psychological thriller, psychological horror kind of thing. But yeah, it's, it's tremendously effective. And I, I am quite the fan of psychological horror. And let's see, the... Yeah, it's it's very compelling to watch Lisa and Jackson match wits, and you know it's it's not the kind of thing where I want this villain to show up in something else also, but I do really you know it's I'd like it's possible he has I haven't watched all of his movies but I would like to watch you know I I yeah there, you know other than Batman Begins I hope that. Killian Murphy has played this kind of soft-spoken sociopath in other movies because he's so incredibly good at it. Like, it's it's wild. Like, I remember watching 28 Days Later when it was fairly new. And then a few years later, seeing Scarecrow, and I was like, holy crap, I had no idea that he was capable of that. And yeah, the, the scenes are easy to follow, they are meant to, and I agree with that decision. And let's see, yeah, and, and so the, the music, 
was him by Marco Beltrami, and yeah, just real quick, gonna go through the other movies that I've seen him handle the score for. Logan, Hitman, 40, Hitman Agent 47, Pan Forstick, The Wolverine, A Good Day to Die Hard, The Thing, 2011 version, Scream 4, Max Payne, Live Free or Die Hard, Underworld Evolution, Flight of the Phoenix, I, Robot, Hellboy, Terminator 3, Blade 2, Resident Evil, Joyride, Dracula 2000, Scream 3, Crow Salvation, Faculty, Scream 2, Mimic, and Scream. He does a really great job. I mean, he does a great job in a lot of those. He does a really great job here. It's very tense and suspenseful. Excuse me. At least some of it is this sort of classic orchestral and, like, it's not, like, really loud and aggressive. It's... I get... I, it's... It's not quite soft and subtle either. It... You know, it does push the tension. Some people found that it was excessive. And I can understand where they're coming from, especially, you know, at the at the start of the movie where, once again, you know, oh, a wallet was stolen. Oh, there was a box hidden inside some frozen, you know, the, yeah, there was a wooden box with frozen fish in it. When that was opened, there was a, a box inside of the, you know, hidden and... You know, it's, yeah, it's not, it's not tense to watch, and if you don't like when the movie tells you this is tense, yeah, you're not going to like it in this movie. Now, it's not, there's not, it's not a comedy, but there is some humor. There's some black comedy, some blue humor, you know, sometimes we laugh at characters, sometimes we laugh with them. The timing's good, the material's good, the skill level's good, and yeah. Again, some people found that there was a little bit too much of it, or, you know, like I said, it was a little too close to, like, 80s comedy. It didn't really fit in a 2005 movie, but yeah. You know, if that's the kind of thing that might bother you, it might bother you this, but it's not, like, constantly trying to make you laugh. There's not, it's not a very violent movie. What there is... It tends to be mild, and the same thing for sexual material. There, there is, there, there are several uh, s words though for, you know, yeah. If if that bothers you. And, but but yeah, I I think they, it's it's an appropriate amount of violence and the the sexual stuff also, you know, appropriate amount. It serves a purpose. And. Yeah, tone-wise, it's fairly serious. And other than the contrived central conceit, the level of realism is high. So, yeah, you do need to suspend disbelief. You know, once you've accepted the concept, there's there's not much to, you know, suspend disbelief for. You know, the laws of physics apply, and other than the... You know the the yeah the central concept has some contrivances, but other than that, it's not. Let's see. And see. yeah, and you know I I agree with the level of realism of the movie. I think it was the right choice. So the pacing, it feels like it's starting slow, but it doesn't actually waste any time. You know, some people do feel like it's slow. It's never actually standing still. It's always developing character and or plot. Let's see. The first 20 minutes make it seem like it's going to be a romantic comedy, and I understand why some people felt that was excessive. Please don't listen to people who claim it's 45 minutes. I think if you make such an exaggeration, you really need to make it clear that it's an exaggeration. If you don't know that that's exaggerated, you might not realize it and might bail on the movie anyway honestly they do a good job making it seem like it's going to be a romantic comedy and the shift to thriller is well handled and you know i know some people say it's, they it should never pretend to be excuse me a different movie obviously a lot of people start the movie watching start watching a movie already knowing that it's a thriller it's not a romantic comedy but if the movie itself just starts out acting like a thriller, 
that's not going to be as effective. Like at first, like the the when she first meets Jackson and they flirt, like we, you know, it's not like nothing is happening. I think it's also some people feel like if they have to sit through any romantic comedy, they feel like they're being like tortured. It's it's not that bad. This movie, if if you can't handle what's in this movie, wow. Anyway, the the you get hints about who they are in the flirtatious scenes. If the movie went directly to when he's threatening her, we wouldn't. the The flirtation makes it even creepier. And actually, knowing that it's that he's evil when you start, you know, like. The first time I was watching the movie, I think I probably already knew, and certainly on every subsequent viewing, I know this guy is threatening her father. You know, she he, he has an assassin that's going to kill her father if she doesn't do what he says. And when they first meet, he's like, you want to go for a drink? They have some really great tacos right over here. Like... Think about how creepy that is. Like, and and when you, you know, once you watch enough of the movie, you realize, oh, because their flight was delayed. Like, the plan was that they meet on the plane. But the flight was delayed, so by the time that they're, you know, once they realize that the, the flight is really delayed, he, you know, he, he approaches her sooner than you know then yeah and and that's that's it you know so so that that really tells you he's a sociopath you know he he can he can go right up to her make eye contact meanwhile he's thinking if she doesn't do what i tell her i might kill her father but he's like so how are things like smiling and and saying nice things and such you know it makes it so much creepier than if just, I mean, there are movies out there, there are some incredible horror movies that start, you know, hit the ground running, and for those, you know, for those, it's right, for a lot of those, not necessarily all of them, but for this one, it's just, it works really well. I don't agree with those who say, I, I don't think there's any padding in this entire movie. Now, the movie is, I swear this is not an exaggeration, the movie is an hour, 13 and a half minutes long without any credits. And with them, it's just short, you know, it's just shy of an hour and 22 minutes. You know, the, the movie is short. It doesn't waste any time. I'm glad they didn't pad, pad it to get a longer running time. You know, I, I saw some people say that, you know, oh, but, you know, you still have to pay the same amount of money for a theater ticket. I 100% get that. I, you know, honestly, I think if you watch this in the theater and you had to pay the same amount as you do for like a two hour movie, I think it would be fair for them to like, I know that, you know, I'm not saying you can travel back in time and make this happen, but if they do it in, in the future, I think it would be nice to like make up for it, maybe some, a, a little bit of free snacks or, or slightly lower ticket cost or something, but but I do think, I, I hate when movies feel like they have to make, you know, there, there's, ah, let me think, what is it called again? Mirror? Mirrors or something? No, wait, no, that's not, no, anyway. Lena Headey, it's like from 2008 or 9, and it's like, it's not a bad concept, but what they had was an episode of Twilight Zone. And I don't know, I... Maybe there was maybe that show wasn't on back then, and they didn't want to like have to wait and have to sit on the script. So what they did was go in and pad it like crazy, and put it out as a movie. And like once you watch the entire thing, you realize how much of it was completely pointless. And I'm not unhappy that I watched the movie, but I would way rather have had that they admitted they didn't have enough material. They couldn't have gotten it to feature length without padding it. They simply couldn't. The concept itself can't take up very much time. It's it's just not the kind of concept that can. And yeah, so I don't like it when movies are padded. This movie is not padded. Now, and let's see the... 
yeah, you know, I would say it's well worth the investment of time. But yeah, if, you know, I already mentioned that the first 20 minutes or so make you feel like a romantic comedy. I th I'm not, yeah, I think, you know, I usually say if you're not interested 30 minutes in, I think that still works for this one. The movie probably isn't your kind of thing. I, I think at that, by that point, excuse me, you, you start getting a real sense of, yeah, how the, the, what kind of movie it really is going to be. Now, in my opinion, it flies by, pun very much intended. It's not, it's, you know, it, it doesn't feel longer than it is, not by a long shot. And, let's see. I mean, yeah, you know what, if you cannot, if, if you, if the idea of sitting through even a minute of romantic comedy, you know, like, makes, you know, just gives you a conniption fit, the moment that romantic comedy stuff starts, you can just, you can fast forward, and, you know, once they get on the plane, you know, no more romantic comedy stuff, if, if you just cannot. And, let's see. And, yeah, you know, some, some people will prefer just the, the part past the romantic comedy stuff, and not the very ending, and, yeah, I mean, you can, you'll, you'll be fine if you just watch those parts, and for sure some people really don't like the, the ending. So, let's see, yeah, just a, as a quick, you know, so when when I say Hitchcock, you know, these are the movies I've watched by Hitchcock, so when I say that this movie is Hitchcockian, you'll have a easier time, you, you have more of a frame of reference. The Hitchcock movies I have watched are Family Plot, Frenzy, Topaz, Torn Curtain, Marnie, The Birds, Psycho, North by Northwest, Vertigo, The Man Who Knew Too Much, The Trouble with Harry, Rear Window, Strangers on a Train, Road, No, Tori, Spellbound, Shadow of a Doubt, Saboteur, Foreign Correspondent, Rebecca, The Lady Vanishes, Secret Agent, and Blackmail. Is that why the girl is called Rebecca in this? Like a Hitchcock tip of the cap? Cool. And... Yeah, the... the so sometimes I try to go into the political leanings of, you know, the the appeal to 9-11 anxieties reads very conservative. Other than that, it's fairly progressive. You know, again, you the hero is a woman, and you're, you know, I, I mean, if you if you hypothetically, if someone's watching this video right now, and they're like, but women can't be smart they can't if, if a man asks a woman to do something that woman can't refuse him this is not a movie for you and let's see. yeah so i would say the the very best thing about this movie is the fact that it manages to squeeze so much tension and suspense out of such a limiting concept you know, others have co said it's like a roller coaster ride, and I would say it's well worth watching a movie at least once just to experience that. And I would say it's worth owning so you can keep rewatching it because it really it's it's incredible. It's not padded. It's not repetitive. Which, since I've already mentioned that it's not repetitive, now this video is slightly repetitive. So the worst aspect. The ending could be better for sure, and some have said that the ending is badly filmed and edited. I don't really agree with that. Now, other people have said that the worst thing about it is that it's cliched. They thought the limiting was excessive. You know, they they thought it was a bad thing that it was so limited. They said it was like a meh episode of Twenty Four. You know, one of them said you could call it Twelve. And, uh, yeah, the, the ending is, and, you know, if, if those things might bother you, you know, yeah, I mean, if you, if you try to change your expectations or standards, at least for while you're watching a movie, 
you know, other than that, I'm not sure there's really much you can do to avoid those issues. I was most worried, you know, I, yeah, before watching it, I, you know, someone told me that the ending ruined the movie. And I was, I, I don't think so at all. I get why some people think so. The thing I was most looking forward to was the acting of Rachel McAdams and Killian Murphy, and they exceeded my expectations. And I would say, you know, if you like this, you know, seek out the work of, you know, the, the actors, the technical crew. And the movie is entertaining to watch, and it is also good as a whole. It's not only parts of it that are good. Now, the trailers, they give away too much, at least a little. The, the two minute, 24 second full trailer gives at least a little too much away. The one minute, 46 second teaser trailer doesn't really. But the, <laughs> the trailer that gives away some of the stuff does give a pretty good idea of what the movie's like. Although, you know, it's the kind of trailer that it, it goes over the movie with a fine tooth comb and finds every like big moment in the movie and puts it all in the trailer to make you think that there are way more moments like that in the movie when in reality they basically they, they took all the you know if, if you haven't already watched the movie don't watch the trailers and let's see yeah it, it doesn't really other than that it doesn't give you that good of an idea of what the movie is like it's you know it kind of misrepresents the the thing that the part of it that makes you know both both of these trailers start out making it look like a romantic comedy that part i don't think is is so bad as a but the you know the teaser makes it seem like a supernatural horror and the other one again gives a you know it gives away too much and it makes it seem like it has it it moves it makes it look like an action movie when it's really a, a thriller that's based a lot of the time just on the words people are saying, you know. With that said, I unreservedly love both trailers. The cover and poster don't give away too much, but, you know, they don't really give you that good an idea of, well, let's say, yeah, what I usually ask is, does... Yeah, the cover and poster, do they give a good idea of what the movie's like? Do you, if you like the cover and poster, will you like the movie? If you don't like them, will you not like the movie? Not as far as the situation goes, but as far as the tension and suspense, yes, it does a pretty decent job represent. It's, I, I don't know, I don't know what one image you could put on the cover or the, the poster that would give you a good idea. Because, like, you can't just have the two of them sitting next to each other talking and her looking distressed, and him looking like he's threatening her. That's just not that exciting of an image. You need a poster to grab, like, I'm not going to hold it up to the camera right now, because that messes with the autofocus sometimes, but, yeah, like, the cover, you know, you see the plane from outside, you see three windows into the, the plane, and there's, like, a hand sticking up against... Why does it say not? Penny's boat, whatever. The the that's not really exactly like something in the movie, but it does tell you this is, you know, this is a suspense movie. And let's see, the movie does not have a lot of metaphors. It's not difficult to understand. You don't need to watch more than once. And let's. See. Yeah, you know, this this is the kind of movie that really shouldn't work, but somehow does. The movie, you know, so much of the movie is set on a plane flying through the air. We're basically watching Jackson try to pressure Lisa into doing what he wants her to do, and her trying to come up with ways of getting out of it without it leading to her father getting killed. So yeah, you, you do have to really go along with it, but really, after 9-11, who doesn't find this kind of thing cathartic? I can understand those who might say that we shouldn't go for this kind of catharsis, but I doubt you can make a serious argument that it is not cathartic for you. Obviously, it would make way more sense to, like, kidnap Lisa, keep her in a room, keep pressuring her until eventually she agrees to make the call. 
I mean, essentially, in the movie, does admit this, presenting it as something Jackson maybe hadn't actually thought about or didn't have a choice about. If the phones, in the, if the plane phones simply didn't work for the entire flight, basically Jackson will either have to give up on his mission or do the kidnapping scenario I just outlined, which he could have done much easier before. But yeah, you know, we are watching a plan that wasn't the exact, you know, wasn't the original plan. The the flight that they're on has been delayed, and the ah, let me think. I guess. I shouldn't give away. No, actually, yeah, that's not a spoiler. The the DHS guy, uh, what's it called? He's checking in at like, what was it, 5.30 p.m. and 5.30 a.m. instead of 5.30 p.m. or maybe it's the other way around. So a lot of time has, you know, yeah, they don't really have as much time as they would like to. Now, yeah. In, in some ways, this movie's way better than it has any right to be, and it's better than you might expect it to be, than you might have heard that it is, because of a great script and because Wes Craven is just that good at psychological horror. You know, that's something that people sometimes forget when they look at his horror movies. Yeah, for sure, some of the time we're scared. It's, it's the... I think in the, in the, in one of the documentaries for this, he talks about, you know, horror movies, it's the, the... Ah, what's it called? The fear of the vulnerability of the body. You know, you might get stabbed, you might get cut. But he is also good at the, the psychological stuff. And you can see some of that in his screen movies, his Nightmare on Elm Street movies. You know, it's not only the threat of being cut or stabbed or that kind of thing. And let's see. And for some of these, I try to go into, do certain aspects of this movie exist just to distract you from weaker elements of the film? No. And then I try to go into if the movie is emotional porn, food porn, some other kind of porn. For sure, the post-9-11 era travel anxiety kind of... Yeah, I could... Like, I think the best reason... If, if you're... If you don't want to watch this movie... That's fine. I'm not trying to tell you you have to. But if you're trying to convince me that you'll never watch this movie, the one thing you could say that more than anything else, I will immediately say, fair enough, this movie's not for you, is if you say, I don't think it's right to use movies as catharsis over the anxiety we feel over 9-11. I 100% understand that. I would never ask someone who felt uncomfortable with that to watch this movie. But, what can I say? I don't personally. And, yeah. And, you know, yeah, the, the reason that it works so, you know, the, yeah, let's see. Yeah, what, what makes it kind of post 9-11 porn is that, you know, it's about someone we empathize with being in danger on a plane due to what it's fair to refer to as terrorists. And, yeah, so this is not one of those... I try to go into, you know, should this have been an episode of Twilight Zone, Outer Limits or something. And it's also not the wrong medium for the story. It, I don't really have any suggestions for how to fix the movie, because I don't think there's anything about it that needs fixing. Now, the tomato meter for this, uh, you know, critics, 79%, users, 64%. And, yeah, I, I think that makes a lot of sense. And the meta rating is 71 out of 100 for the critics, and 8.7 out of 10 for users. So that's kind of interesting. The, the On Rotten Tomatoes, more users, more more critics than users liked it, and on Meta, it's the opposite. But yeah, and this only has six point four on IMDb. I I really feel like it should be higher. Anyway, let's see. And yeah, and the MPAA age rating for this movie is PG thirteen, and I agree with that. That's that's also what I would give it. There are a couple of times where it comes close to going beyond it but it never does cross that line. 
and so so yeah you know if you like the the concept of these you know of, of Lisa being trapped on this plane trying desperately to think of a way to get out of doing the the thing Jackson wants her to I would definitely recommend you watch this movie now I give this eight terrible flights out of ten and that is it for the non-spoiler review section so we get into spoilers thoughts section start disclaimers and click on the note to try food if you don't care about these disclaimers, I'll try to keep short remote, but your mileage may vary. You can skip right ahead to the section under your choice in the description box. I often try to talk very fast between disclaimers, since a lot of it's very standard information, and my back is killing me. I'm not going to keep speaking as fast as I sometimes do during this section once I get into the video itself. With that said, please be note that some of the specific discussion of the movie may be in this section. I realize this is real long. I'm going to do what I can to make it worth your time. So, yeah, throughout the rest of the movie, the video, from here on out, spoilers to this movie, I will not be one. I will not be warning before I spoil, unless I'm spoiling something else. This video is not going to contain any clips of any kind. The most visual gets when I sometimes act something out, so feel free to watch something visual, such as clips from the subject in another tab. And let's see. Right, so content warning and or trigger warning. Rape, uh, being threatened by someone who's staying in close proximity to you for a long time and let's see, yeah I'm not sure I'm gonna be criticizing depictions of violence but just in case I do I don't have a problem with violence more in general the thing is one of my favorite horror movies movies in general also the cornworks the fly video drum etc I don't have a problem with film sexuality nudity disturbing upsetting material in general monsters from my favorite movies I guess an argument could be made that the the rape in the backstory is basically there to, you know, it's it's there so that she has some trauma that can drive her to fight back against another victimizer and ultimately, you know, I, an argument could be made that that's in bad taste. Now, I, I really appreciate that we don't see it, you know, basically like Lisa describes it, but... We, we don't get any flashback. So I got this on sale, so anything in was expensive. Negative, I say in this, it's not out of bitterness. I don't feel like movie wasted my time. Nobody forced me to watch it or to make this video. I'm not upset at how it compares to other movies like it. I don't have some personal vendetta against anyone who worked on making it. To the best of my ability, the negative things I send this are for criticisms based on budget, when it came out, what it was trying to achieve, etc. Instead of me quoting all the lines I love from this movie, let me just say here that I loved every line they put in the I may be known for quote section. So you can just look that up instead of me sitting here quoting all of them. And let's see. So, excuse me, the rest of this video is not a review. It's a series of, well, thoughts. Some of this analysis, some of this MSC Grey Rift Drives and other jokes. Especially jokes. Uh, was there? Actually, I'm not sure there are going to be that many jokes in this one, but yeah, time codes for all the sections are in the description box. The section right after this one is left I have while watching in chronological order. You can do it as a running commentary, live tweeting, or the like. The section after that is thoughts I have before watching. And the final section. Again, stuff I think it's worthwhile to get into on Rotten Tomatoes, Metacritic, MDB, and Wikipedia. And that pretty much covers this section. And yeah, so here we go with. Notes taken while watching. I love that the tense and suspenseful music starts immediately. I really love that when we first meet Jackson, at first it seems like he's just being nice, trying to help these two women 
But he, you know, his grabbing the arm, the guy's arm, and though, then those intense eyes let us know there's something threatening there. The movie does a great job at s subtly hinting that Lisa doesn't want to get romantically involved. I mean, at first you might think it's just the fact that they only just met, and then we, you know, you see the scar on her chest, which is too big for being something that happened from a bad fall, from her slipping or something. Or, like, you know, if a, if a knife slipped or something, that's, that was definitely someone attacked her. And, let's see. What does that say? Right, the flirting really does work incredibly well. Uh, you know, we, we see how these two could be in a movie that's purely a romantic comedy instead of just masquerading as one at the start. I, I wish more movies would pretend to be something else. I, I really... Or maybe at least like fan edits, you know, like edit in someone, like their performance from another movie and make it seem like it's going to be, and then, you know, suddenly the real movie starts, I don't know. I guess, to be fair, it should be, you should always be warned that that's not what the whole movie is going to be, but I just kind of love, I, I, I really love movies that completely surprise you with, you, you don't see where they were going. As Jackson walks off, we hear him say on the phone, no, there's time. And we realize later he's referring to the fact that he can still force Lisa to make the call in the air, despite the fact that the flight was delayed and that Keith's hotel visit will start sooner. And yeah, 17 minutes into the film, Lisa's on the plane, so is Jackson. So yeah, the first 20 minutes are the, the yeah, let's see. So it's definitely 5.30. Done deal. Again, later we realize he's talking about Keith. You know, it's it's such a great, because, like, you know, if you if you watch it and you don't know that he's talking about Keith, and, and really, you realize it's not long after anyway, but it's, like, you understand why Lisa doesn't immediately, you know, 5.30? That could only mean, no, 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 it's 5.30, you know, it's, uh, like, if he had started reciting the, the code words to activate Winter Soldier's mind control, then it's like, okay, there's something going on here, you know. Well, I already did a video for the episode that aired yesterday of Falcon and Winter Soldier, so that's fresh in my mind. So, yeah, 20 minutes in, the plane is taking off, and let's see. I think, do they land little over 50 minutes, so it's maybe like half an hour on the plane itself. But yeah, 22 minutes in, Jackson starts telling Lisa that he's really, what he's really there for, and starts threatening her. I really appreciate that Jackson does have a way to get rid of the stewardess. As he told her, he can point out, you know, he, he says, ah, I've never met this woman before, but I, I took out my wallet. And she just went crazy, you know, I think she might have been drinking, you know. Like, hypothetically, let's say that the, the you know, Lisa gets like, like, like a, a cop, you know, has her do the breathalyzer or something. That's going to prove that she's had, you know, she had bad, she had cheap wine at the funeral. She had cheap vodka at the, the airport bar, you know, a lot of that's still in her system. And... And, and yeah, you know, the wallet could be his since he removed, what was it he said, the, the driver's license, the credit card, and so, something, you know. We, we didn't see him put in something else, but, you know, very likely. I mean, who's, who travels with a wallet that's completely empty? He probably put his own in, but if we saw him put his own in, then we would have realized who he was. You know, we just saw someone pulling out the ones that belonged to Joe. And it is also, like... Wow, did part of the, like, the fact that his initials are the same as her father's, that, like, that was part of the plan. I mean, that's a bit, so, hypothetically, if her father had a completely different name, it would just, I, I feel like that would make more sense if it turned out that his 
name was actually just like he like like it's a uh, what's it called a, a code name or something that that wasn't something he was actually called you know I I feel like that should have been in there but anyway but but yeah you know then when the when the stewardess get does get there you know the the Jackson is like. Did you did you need another pillow, Reese? And you know, and she's crying because of all the fear. She's she's terrified that her father's gonna die. And and you know, the steward says, "Oh, honey, are you okay?" And and Jackson's like, "There's been a death in the family." Oh, just, I mean, we're not surprised that you stabbed her, but you didn't have to twist the blade like that. Like it's just like. You know, well, I mean, Lisa, if you insist, I'm going to have to kill your father. You know, it's just the, you know, and at the same time, yeah, there was a death in the family. Her grandmother just died. I happen to know that you do. And I know that you're the only person who can get this done in the time I need it done. Which also kind of suggests that maybe originally there were other like they were going to put pressure on other people but because of the the flight plans changing so so late and the uh what's it called uh, wrong moment. flight plan and the uh, and keith arriving 12 hours earlier or later than expected yeah i appreciate that she does call her father before agreeing to make the call to the hotel because really why should she believe that her father isn't already dead and I appreciate that she does have to push a little before Jackson lets her. And Lisa writes in the Dr. Phil book, as Jackson has to help the other woman with her luggage, such excellent editing, really heightening the tension. You know, Lisa knows she has limited time. Jackson is watching her and aware of what she's doing. And just the whole, just so, and, and Jackson actually does, he's like, he starts to walk back so he can stop her. But then, like, the, the, okay, I, Sheila, her name is Sheila. You know, the, the, yeah, the, the middle-aged tanned woman. I think the movie wants us to laugh at the fact that she's, you know, I don't know, she's maybe in her 40s or something, and she still, like, really dresses up. Like, she tries to attract, you know, she, she tries to be very attractive. I really don't like laughing at things like that. I wish that joke wasn't in the movie, so I'm not going to be playing into it. Anyway, Sheila, you know, Jackson starts to turn around and he's gonna he's gonna move back, but she's like, I'm sorry, I swear it'll just be another, you know, and it is like before he you know, be er, earlier he helped her put the the uh, yeah, the, the luggage back up there. And now she needs him to get I, I I'm not, do we see what she gets? She gets something out of the bag, you know, but yeah, I mean, if they're going to be flying for hours and it's something, you know, we, we don't know exactly what it is, but maybe it's a book or something and she's like, I, I have to know what happens next, you know, and yeah, I mean, I, I believe her. I don't think she, I, I think she would have a lot of trouble if she tried to move the entire bag completely by herself. Now, uh, let's see, and there wasn't really, I mean, I don't think that he's the only, he's the only young man near, you know, on the entire plane that could help, but he's the one who's close by, and it's basically, you know, Sh Sheila is flirting with him. Uh, you know, I, I imagine those two teenage boys probably could, but she's not interested in those. I will admit that the headbutt is a kind of forced way to heighten the tension, like, you know, it's it's kind of supposed to. It's it's like they're afraid that if nothing violent happens in a really long time, the audience will lose interest or something. But like, what if he had? You know, what if he just straight up knocked her out and she's? Oh, I mean, yeah, he did knock her out. What if she stayed knocked out for way longer? Like, what if when the plane lands, she's just barely coming out of it? It's just, it's such a bad idea and. I'm not sure I know what else they could have done, really. I I mean, if if it was just that he 
gets up out of the seat, walks over to where the, the old woman has the book, and the, you know, and then, then goes back. I mean, that's kind of boring, so they needed something. Yeah. It's hard for me to put into words just how much I love Killian Murphy just utterly destroying Dr. Phil, making so much fun of his crappy, stupid, quote-unquote, self-help. I'm not saying that everyone who does self-help is full of BS, but Dr. Phil is. Although I guess maybe the intended effect is actually for audience members to hate Jackson. A lot of people do love Dr. Phil. I feel so bad for Cynthia. She's so happy that she got things right for Keith. And then Lisa has to tell her to change it again. Grandma died. We took the next flight. Keith changed his room. And here we are. I think people miss this when they complain that the plan is way too contrived. This was not plan A, you know. And Jackson tells Lisa that she, he, sorry, he has been stalking her and try, trying to figure out why she's such a loner, which tells us that there is something. Now I've seen some criticize the movie and say that once you see she has a scar on her chest and... And, and you see that she's slightly closed off when talking to this young man. If you're a woman, if you're a woman watching, you already know exactly what's going on. I think that's probably 100% accurate. But the movie is meant to appeal to straight white cis men, and I speak from experience, a lot of us would not have realized if they hadn't basically spelled out later in the movie. I mean, on IMDb, in the frequently asked questions, apparently some people didn't realize that it was rape, despite how clear the movie does make it by the end of the movie. The fact that they never directly say the word rape or, you know, something, uh, you know, uh, a euphemism or something. Some of people apparently thought that she was mugged, not raped. And I can imagine, hmm, excuse me, if it was a mug, I've, I've never been mugged or raped. If it was a mugging and not a rape, she wouldn't be as close off to, like, flirting and such. Obviously, it would still be traumatic. But yeah, you know, I, I agree. And the, the I, I just, I don't think you should be frustrated with the scriptwriters of the movie. You should be frustrated with how many men don't think about, like, just a lot of men, when we, you know, we see an attractive woman, you know, we, we, we don't necessarily think about if, like, the, the I, I recently saw, uh, let me think. I think it was because there was this, let me think, there was like a compilation of, of Scarlett Johansson, you know, firing back when she was being interviewed about MCU stuff and someone made sexist remarks. And, you know, yeah, there were like, there just, what was it, seven minutes straight of just her, you know, and each time she doesn't spend forever doing it. And someone had one of one of the YouTube comments was, I think a lot of people forget, you know, a lot of people because she's attractive, they forget that she's also a human being, like how they did with Megan Fox. And yeah, it's you know, it, it really it's a problem. I agree that it's you know, the the Men and women watching this movie will have extremely different experiences, will see Lisa very differently for a lot of the movie. I just don't think it's right to... I, I, don't, I don't think it's the, the screenwriter... I, I think, if anything, we should be happy that the screenwriter acknowledges that a woman who has been raped is going to have a harder time flirting with someone, you know. I mean, I think... There's probably people who, if not, hypothetically, if the movie never addressed the scar, if it showed it early and then never brought it up again, I think you'd have people, excuse me, wondering why is she fighting back so much against this guy? Why does, why is the flirting, you know, why, why doesn't she go further when they flirt? You know, because a lot of people just don't think about that. You know, I, I, yeah. So, I, I'm, again, an argument could be made that it is wrong to make a character have trauma like that in their past. 
you know, I I could imagine like if you watch this movie, it might be triggering to to you know because I mean she straight up she gives some of the details. Now she's not as explicit as you know she she could have gotten into more detail than she does, but it is still like she talks about it. She talks about how like she she still remembers it very you know. I forget how long did she say it had been? it had been like several months at least I think but you know she like she she says you know it was it was during the day you know it was light out and and the the yeah I think that's the thing yeah and Lisa takes a while while in the bathroom and so Jackson catches her having written and he There, and he spells out that if a stewardess had seen the had seen it, the assassin would have killed her father, which we do find out later isn't true. But Lisa has been given no reason to think that yet. You know, Jackson has thoroughly proven that the assassin is near her father. I mean, that was a creative way to try to stop Jackson. The exact words on the mirror are, "18F has bombed." If she hadn't written in such large letters, it would have made more for more words, but it also wouldn't have been as quick to write, and it is enough to get the message across. I guess the movie never really spells out exactly how Jackson got the book from the old lady, but it seems like it must have been while she was looking away or sleeping or something. I mean, she does seem somewhat forgetful. She also almost went on the plane without her umbrella. It's pointed out that the teenager is now missing his pen, which we remember because it was brought to our attention earlier. It's kind of a memorable pen, you know, it's got like a monster on the, at the very tip of it or whatever, you know. And this means that when we see it in Lisa's hand later, we know where it came from. Actually, yeah, didn't she, she might, did she maybe put it in her sock or something when she sat down? You know, I can only speak from personal experience, but I didn't realize that she had the pen, neither did the people I've shown the movie to. Excuse me. It was a surprise, but it wasn't the kind of thing where we're like, well, where did the pen come from in the first place? How did she get it, etc. We cut to Keith and see that his family is going to be in the hotel. You know, it's it's not only going to be him, his wife, the two kids, which obviously means that the assassination is going to kill innocent people. You know, people who are not making decisions that impact Jackson and the people he works with. Not that it would be okay if it was only Keith, Keith, but it does make it worse that it is. And yeah, 47 minutes into the film, and Lisa has just resigned and made the call to the hotel. So it took 25 minutes of movie time from when he started threatening her to her making the call. See, and that's the thing, like, if it, I think if it had been like 10 minutes more, I think it might have been too much. I think it would have gotten stale. Let's see. But but yeah, you know, he says for sign. Made the call to the hotel. Jackson tells her he won't call off the assassin, but also tells her that the assassin actually won't kill her father if he doesn't tell her. Sorry, if she, if he doesn't tell him to, and without realizing it, he tells her without thinking about it that. Keith's family is in the hotel. I do my part and move on. He's clearly not himself happy with it, but it is his job. He is a sociopath, so he's willing to do it. Ah, my back. Charles, the kids are exhausted. That is very believable, and Keith still isn't okay with it until he hears that Lisa made the change. He trusts her. Fifty minutes in, the plane is about to land. Lisa grabs the pen after bending over, claiming she did that because of the pain he caused her when he attacked her. So yeah, overall, they spend about half an hour on the plane. Anyway, Jackson talks about how it's going to go when they land. Lisa seems resigned. Jackson thinks it's because he has basically broken her will. But we, the audience, know she's planning something, and it's got to involve that pen. And, you know, the, the, and, and, you know, cuts and we see the boat checked 
uh, you know, for anything suspicious by the Coast Guard, and there's nothing in there. And yeah, Lisa takes the the seatbelt. Take her, yeah, unbuckles her seatbelt, which, you know, she's they're about to leave the plane, so it's not like this, you know, why is she doing that kind of thing? And you know, we we see her like pop the 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 you know the monster head off the the tip of the pen. And, you know, the, the light, I, let's see, is it the fasten seatbelt light or something, you know, the, no, it, yeah, it's, ah, excuse me, it's, yeah, it's the light that tells you that you can't, you, you can unbuckle your seatbelt now, you know, so we, you know, we hear that and he looks at it because he wasn't expecting it. And in just that, you know, brief, like, it's maybe less than a second. But she manages to stab him right in the... I, I find that very, like, yeah. I, I really like that she gets to fight back like this. And, yeah, 54 minutes into the movie, they're running off the plane. Lisa hears the code for security guards over the radio, knows that she has to hide, so she pretends to be airport food service. And, you know, yeah, she knows how to talk like that. It's also... If anyone has watched Alias, it's very, like, Sidney Bristow over the panel that is the exact same thing. And the doctor that checks the pen in Jackson's neck is the jerk passenger from earlier. And until he sees the pen, he's still like, ah, oh, these, these people are so annoying kind of thing. And just, yeah, it's, it's kind of funny. And, yeah. I really love that the, the, uh, Wait, is her what? Yeah, the the yellow and the little girl. She pushes her carry on out in front of Jackson, so he trips. Obviously, he's not going to like attack an eleven year old on the plane in front of everyone. You know, so it slows him down. Like, if they were alone, she's not going to do that. You know, she's she would risk her own safety. But yeah, and one of the one of the reviewers said that you know. Over the course of the movie, the 11-year-old realizes that there's something dangerous going on there, and so she ends up helping there at the end. And the the reviewer said that's why his name is Jack the Ripper. You know, he goes after women, and women working together can take him out. Because if she hadn't done that, he would have caught up to Lisa in the, uh, what's it called, the... the uh, train car thing you know when he gets there just as the doors are closing so he can't get them open if he had gotten there like half a second earlier he would have gotten in there and yeah they're not alone so he can't do just anything to, yeah let me let me just briefly let's hypothetically say he manages to get in there and you know yeah so she's she's on the on the train and so is he now he can't, you know, he's having trouble speaking because of the pen, but I'm guessing, let's see, I figure that he would probably try to, like, grab Lisa, and maybe some of the people on the train would, like, come to her aid or something, and I'm thinking either he's gonna, like, try to attack them with, with something, you know, like, let's see, if any of them has, like, a heavy bag or something, he's going to use that as a blunt object to, to hit them with. Or he's going to try to, like, write on a notepad, you know, this woman just stabbed me, I'm a cop or something, you know. Actually, yeah, once again, we don't know exactly what's in his wallet. I could imagine that if someone is like, hey, what, let her go, why, why, what are you doing to her? He's going to take the wallet out, flip it open, and there's going to be a badge. And it's probably like a fake badge or something. But, I mean, if you see a man chasing a woman and he's, he shows you a badge, like there's some chance you're going to be like, oh, I guess she's, maybe she's dangerous. She, you know, he needs to arrest her. And like, I feel like the moment you see a badge and you see her running away and you see he has just been stabbed, you're gonna think, 
she stabbed him to get out of uh, uh, what's he called custody, you know. So I I think if if Jackson had managed to catch up to her much sooner than when she's in the house, that you know, I th I think he very likely could have. He, he would have been able to, to stop her. And again, like hypothetically, like let's say that, excuse me, let's say that he manages to restrain her. All he needs, I mean, uh, you know, the, the part of the reason she stabbed him in the, in the neck was that so, so he couldn't cry out and like call the, the assassin, for example. But I mean, if she had, yes, yeah, she grabbed his phone but if he managed to restrain, let's, yeah, train, train car, he manages to restrain her, he gets the cell phone back from her, he can't speak, but he texts, kill Joe Reisert, to, to the, the assassin, that's it, you know, and it's possible he's not gonna, I don't know if he would kill Lisa in the law, I, actually, yeah, probably, at, at that point, for sure, her father would be dead, you know, if she hadn't, it, it's, and again, I get, you know, that's why people say it's contrived. If she hadn't stabbed him exactly right, it wouldn't have stopped him from speaking, you know, but, and, and I'll grant, you know, I don't think there's anything in her past that means she would have exact perfect precision for that, but it's a Hollywood movie, you know. Very smart of Lisa to take Jackson's phone so he can't yeah so so that he can't make the call and she knew where it was because she saw him answer it a couple of times it's not like it was buried in one of the bags or something he had it so you could easily answer it it's like jacket pocket pants pocket something like that you know and Jackson reaches the train thing just after the doors are too you know like the doors aren't closed by the time he gets there but they're so close he, he can't, like, get a few fingers in there and, and, like, prevent them from opening. And it's, you know, it's it's one of those things. Like, it, it, yeah, it's going to drive off as soon as the, yeah. And Keith trusts Lisa so much that he doesn't mind taking the kids out on the balcony, which, again, you know, like, the... Uh, and, you know, considering that the movie is so much about post-9-11 fears, I really appreciate that the terrorists are decidedly not Middle Eastern. The, they're not. They're not Muslim. There's not. You know, Jackson is definitely from the West. There's no. You know, and the specific terrorists. I mean, I don't know that I would know this if it wasn't written on the IMDb trivia. But you know, it is there. The specific. You know, the the guys on the boat are heard speaking Russian. And I don't think it's just accent. I think it's words. Like, they are straight, you know. So, yeah, this is like, it's, you know, Putin or something has, has you know, there's there are not a lot of, of Russian Muslims. There are not a lot of, you know, most... <sighs> Russia and Muslims have a pretty bad history together. So it is extremely unlikely that... You know, if the terrorists were Muslims, they would not be speaking Russian. They would not be, you know, and, and I think maybe also if you look at them, they look, they definitely don't look Middle Eastern. They look, they, they, I could believe that they're Russian or something. Okay, I am not going to make excuses for the movie Double Dipping and using both that the cell phone has no signal and that it has low battery. That is ridiculous. That's two cell phone you know, two two cliches explaining why a cell phone is unusable within like three minutes. And I think when you see that it has no signal, it actually has a lot of battery left. You know, so a few minutes later, it has signal but no battery. It's like, oh, come on, man. We know how long a battery on a cell phone can last, you know. And the cell phone is completely out of battery just as she makes the call to her father so she can warn him. And he, he does answer it, you know, but just, doesn't, yeah. It's also kind of weird and silly that Cynthia has to tell them in person. Like, Keith and the family, you know, yeah, tell, tell in person Keith and, her, and, and his family that they have to leave. She already pulled the fire alarm. Who stays inside when there's a fire alarm going off? 
I mean, I, I don't doubt Keith has a lot of self-confidence, but I don't know what he thinks he's going to do against the fire if he's at the top of a building. I mean, it's not even like the, the building is close enough to the water that they could jump and hopefully, think, you know, like, not land too hard. There is literally nowhere else to go. And I appreciate how close... Right, how close of a call the the you know like the the rocket the the ah what's it called are they secret service or are they called something else but the yeah the the guys prank pr the from my brain is soup my brain is soup the guys protecting Keith and his family they just you know, the last. Two of them just barely jump out of the way of, like, the the explosion. You know, it seems like no one got hurt from it. But, yeah. And Lisa recognized the silver BMW that Jackson talked about. But the assassin is already in front of the house, so she has to run him over. I saw one, one reviewer criticize that the neighbors don't react and the police only show up after Jackson has been dealt with. I agree with that those are weaknesses, but I don't want the movie to have the cops there at the end, and it is very typical Hollywood that, you know, it has to be the protagonists, or failing that, the, like, some of the supporting characters, you know, established characters, it, it can't, you know, it has to be people we've seen before that take care of the threat. The police never show up in time in these kinds of movies, and honestly, would you really want them to? Like, I know that what you're saying is it's, it would be more realistic, but do you actually think that the movie would be better? And, and I think it's it's it makes sense to say, as you know, you, we, we have to criticize when, when movies ask us to suspend disbelief and we're like, I can't do that when this is what you're asking me to believe in, I think that's good. I'm not saying, you know, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be criticizing that, but I am saying, I, I think in this kind of situation, I think it's, I, I would, if, if I had written it, personally, I would have included that realistically the shot, the, the cops should have shown up, but I'm glad that they didn't. I mean, if you're watching a Hollywood movie and the cops show up, you know the movie hasn't ended yet. If if there's a if there's some kind of confrontation and the cops show up, there must be more confrontations later in the movie. And Cynthia answers the phone and she's like, "Doctor Lang Hotel." She's a, you know what you know what she is. She's adorable. That's what she is. Like she's like her voice is really low because she's so scared, but she still answers the phone and I think she answers it pretty quickly too, and just like. You know, she's, she's, like, it's, like, it's, um, almost like it's a mantra. She's repeating, like, how may I be of service? And she's just, like, it's, I, I really like her. I like Jamie Mays in, in this and elsewhere. And, let's see. There we go. An hour and four minutes in, and Jackson has arrived at the house of at the, at the home of the father, and the climax enters its final phase. And that, yeah. So the the final climax, the once Jackson arrives at the house, there's less than ten minutes left. Now, at least one reviewer pointed out that when Lisa says "not in my house," it's referring to multiple things. The fact that Lisa is on her home turf. And let's see, what was the other? I, th I think one of them was that she's de defending her bodily autonomy. Uh, you know, it's not not in my house. Like, you can't do that to me. I will not let you. And I really, you know, a lot of people can't stand movies where women aren't just victims. But I really think that you you should at least look at, like, it's... You know, it's, it's not like she's constantly running around and, you know, she can, anything guys can do, she can do even better kind of thing. You know, they, they, I personally think that 
I'm, I'm not saying everyone who has been victimized, but, and, and you know, I, I don't know, I guess some people might say that the movie is misrepresenting rape survivors, but, you know, for sure, some rape survivors would be devastated if they were attacked again, but there are some who would, yeah, basically, you know, they would fight back with all their might. And the and we do also got to remember, she hasn't really done anything that physical until the the pen stabbing. You know, she's basically. Excuse me. And I think it's all yeah. Actually, the thing that makes her decide to fight him after you know she she makes the call, but the I, I I'm not sure she would have been as, you know, I, I, the, when, when she realizes that Keith's family is also going to be there. That's one of the big. As others have pointed out, the last bit with the chase is completely different from the movie leading up to it. It's very difficult to end a thriller or horror movie in a satisfying way. Action movie, no problem. You just have the good guy and the bad guy face off one last time. Have a clear conclusion to the fight. Drama, have the most dramatic thing in the movie happen. Thrillers and horror movies have to empower the hero who up to this point has been very disempowered. I'm not saying they couldn't have done a better job, but I don't hate the ending the way other people do. I don't blame them for hating it, but I, you gotta admit. Like, if you tell me that you enjoyed this movie, but you didn't want to see Lisa defeating Jackson you know, smacking him in the face with stuff and trying to shoot him and, you know, I, I'm sorry, I have a hard time believing that. You know, the, the... I love the way Lisa throws Jackson Lord's back in his face about logic, you know. Where's your, what was it, fact-driven... Wait, male fact-driven logic now, so, something like that, which was an incredibly sexist thing to say. It almost felt like a kick the dog moment, like, a, no, 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 this is the bad guy, because some of, you know, some of the time, the things he says aren't, excuse me, again, I don't know if we're supposed to be on his side when he criticizes Dr. Phil, but, yeah, Dr. Phil sucks. Big Joel. I want to say, is the YouTuber who did a really great video talking about it. I If if I tried to explain it, I would literally just be repeating what he said. Now, let's see. And, yeah, Lisa grabs the, is that a hockey stick or something? You know, but we were told earlier her father doesn't throw things like that out. And... When we don't know where Jackson is, and Lisa's trying to figure out if he's going to come in from the front or behind, since there's two doors, it is legitimately very tense and suspenseful. I think even if you don't like this movie, or this last part of the movie, you have to give it that. Great suspense about whether or not Jackson's hiding behind a shower curtain. Very psycho. And Lisa answers the phone in 911, so she manages to tell him about Jackson. I don't really have, I don't really understand why some people have such an issue with Lisa at times dominating in the fight against Jackson. We know that she, ah, uh, what was I saying? We know that she at least used to be, like, you know, like, yeah, she used to be a cheerleader. She was, like, doing sports, so she's athletic. He's already said that he doesn't make a good assassin. I mean, okay, the thing, the specific thing he said was that he's a lousy shot, but, like, you know, he probably very rarely ends up having to personally attack anyone. He's the manager. You know, at the very start, she gets the drop on him, even, you know, he managed to surprise her, you know, be, at, at, like, behind the door. But she was already in a combat stance. Like, he had to, like, st you know, like, she's standing, like, uh, and, and he had to, like, be really flat against so you wouldn't think there was someone behind the door. You know, he's intentionally 
leading her to think that there's no one behind the door, that he must be on the outside of the door, so that she'll go up to the door and, and close it. And, yeah, doing that means you have to, yeah. And Lisa's dad shoots Jackson, finishing off the change section, an hour and 12 minutes into the movie. So the wrap-up after that is like two minutes or less. Some people say this movie is too feministic because Lisa fights Jackson. Other people say it's misogynistic because Lisa's dad is the one to kill Jackson. I mean, you, you, it's, it's impossible. So, it's, yeah. Personally, I'm really glad that it gives her, you know, that, that so much of, uh, let's see, I gotta speed this up. The, the, let's see, yeah, I think I'm just gonna, I really love the ending with Lisa telling off the two obnoxious guests. I have to wonder if the thing that really set her off is actually that they said that Cynthia should be fired because she's incompetent and cheeky, which is completely ridiculous. But the, the, yeah, because, you know, right after she, it be, yeah, before they say that, she says, how can I fix this or something like that? You know, she sounds like she's still trying to be really people pleaser 24-7 as she's been, you know. And yeah, it really is like the, you know, earlier Cynthia was the one who called them assholes. And Lisa said, no, no, no there are no asshole guests. But the... Okay, so I'm just really briefly, I I think this is going to be the only time in the video that I act out, but yeah, just some. We could, we could have you, we could have you fill out a comment card. A comment card? She asked us to fill out a comment card. You want us to fill out a comment card? Yes, I do. And once you filled it out, you can go ahead and shove it right up your ass. I just, I really love that, and the, I mean, the two actors playing the obnoxious guests are so good. So, yeah, the movie is, I already mentioned that, actually, so I'm just going to move on to next section. Notes taken while watching. Before watching, sorry, notes taken before watching. So, I am going to scroll through the list of things that the people who worked on this also did. And here we go. So, spoiling screen one. The, the last part of the climax in her dad's house is basically the climax of screen one, but with less people, victims, and lines spoken. And I kind of love that. No more spoilers for Swim 1 for the time being. The rocket launcher at the end is perhaps excessive. Maybe it should have been a sniper, but then it might feel too small. If And if you just have a sniper fire with and, and miss, that's pretty boring. But, you know, the rocket hits. It's just that they get clear of the explosion in time. It, you know, so some people say, wouldn't it be easier to get a bomb close to them? Well, I mean, probably not. That's the whole point of, you know, you can't get explosives very close to there, so the only thing you have is a rocket launcher. And, let's see. So, the very ending of the movie does not have Lisa or anyone else catch the actual terrorist, the people who are at Jackson, the rocket launcher people, but just because we don't see it doesn't mean that it won't soon happen, since the DHS acting secretary is obviously going to investigate this, and there are several people he could identify, including Jackson. And, you know, from there, look at the people he's worked with, worked for, you know, they have his cell phone, you know, the, the, they can track the calls that he's made, you know, when, when he called, when, when he was called by others and he's like, 5.30, okay, no, 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 we still have a window of time, you know, this kind of things, he was not talking to Silver BMW Assassin Man. He was definitely talking to someone higher up than him. Now, it's possible that they heard and, like, got rid of their phones or something. But if not, I mean, all you got to do is get his phone, look at the, the numbers most recently active, 
and you have a huge lead. I, I really don't think the movie needs to show this. I, I feel like it's it I'm sorry, it's right there. It's it's so it's it's a very it's not much of a, a leap of logic. One criticism I saw that I can't really argue with is that Lisa has an extremely easy time getting past airport security when leaving the red eye flight, and the fact that Jackson can run so soon after being jabbed with a pen. I agree that wouldn't really that wouldn't happen in real life, but this is a Hollywood movie, so it's not like some unusual thing to find in one of these, that someone can move fast comfortably after being injured or experience something that would be, you know, in real life it would be an injury. I'm not saying, again, sometimes I wonder if, sometimes I worry I sound like an apologist. I'm just saying, there, it's not that bad of a, uh, that's apologism, crap. Okay, what I'm trying to get at is, I don't think this is going to hurt people. Comparatively, the the ah, let's see, what can I what can I get into that doesn't spoil? Um, hypothetically, let's say that at the end, the only way for Lisa to stop Jackson was to kill someone innocent. And, you know, the movie basically said, no, no, it's okay. It's okay to kill innocent people as long as we stop the bad guys. That's something that a lot of people do think, and a lot of movies do, you know, pat them on the back and say, you're absolutely right. That's something that causes real-life harm. Seeing Killian Murphy running, even though he's just had a pen in his neck, that isn't something that, you know, and, and right, and some people also thought, oh, isn't he about to die? No, no, no. It, He's, he got stabbed in, like, the, the, what's it called? The voice box thing. He didn't get stabbed anywhere near the, what's it called? The carotid artery. You know, you, it's, it's not everybody who, who gets an, a knife or, you know, like, if you can, you can get stabbed or cut or something. If it's not deep, if it doesn't touch the carotid artery, it's not going to kill you. Now, you know, it's not going to feel fantastic. But, you know, that's, and, and again, that's the thing, because in movies, people never seem to miss the carotid artery. And so when a movie like this comes out, it's like, what? I thought you, you gently press a finger against the, the throat and immediately the, you know, there's a huge flood of, of blood pouring out. That's just not how it is. If you don't hit the specific artery, it's, there's not going to be, or, or, and, and you don't get extremely deep with it. And let's, I mean... I don't think you could claim that it's a deep cut. Like it's it not very much of that pen went in. I saw at least one pay, person say that the assassination would fail if they couldn't make convince Lisa to make the call. Like, or if she completely freaks out and they had to land the plane, get her to a hospital or something. I agree that there are a lot of ways that the plane could have ended up not leading to Keith's death. But the way I see it, this is just one plan. Like, if Lisa didn't make the call they would find a way to stealthily assassinate her and then find another opportunity to kill Keith. You know, it's not, like, the, the, ah, I'm saying, you know, I, I don't think they needed Keith dead within, like, 12 hours or something. I just think this was the first good shot they got at it, you know, and if, if Lisa got killed quietly, then... Keith might not realize that there was a problem, and he might not take extra precautions next time. Excuse me. So Jackson attacking Lisa in the back bathroom, and the, you know, there's... There's a little bit of a sexual nature to, to some of the, you know... And him implying it was a quickie, you know, the, the, some of the ways that he's gross, but... I do find it kind of funny when the, the steward, like, you know, the steward is like, this isn't a motel, you know, and then she's, like, collecting people's garbage, and she looks directly at Jackson and says the word, trash, it's just such a great, you know, using words, double meaning. And I really appreciate, you know, the writer could easily have, I think it would have made, I think it would have been a mistake if the stewardess had been saying these things to Lisa. That would have felt really cruel and mean-spirited. And I'm, I'm aware that the character herself wouldn't be trying to be cruel and mean-spirited. But 
the screenwriter is choosing what to make these characters say. You know, at all points, these are decisions made. And both times that the Stooges confronts, you know, he she never says to Lisa that she's trashy. She only ever says it to Jackson, you know, both times. And yeah. At the very end of the flight, after Jackson has terrorized Lisa with just what he's saying, she stabs him, and we see the pen is mightier than the word. I do agree with those who say that the DHS secretary basically just there to be a target. He's not an interesting character. He's a character because it wouldn't be as exciting if they were just blowing up an empty room. And, you know, his family is especially only there. I mean, the kids have no lines. I think the wife has one line, you know, the, the kids are exhausted, you know, that's the only thing she says, and they, yeah, they exist, and, and they're, they're this ridiculous, like, stereotypical, like, oh, happy family, children, kind of thing, you know, like, he's sitting there on the plane, he's like, you know, okay, so I've just written something, so go, you know, go deal with that, and then, like, his, his son throws, like, a ball at him, he, he, you know, catches it and throws back, or something like that, you know, and it's like, only in movies are families this happy in, in just, but, you know, it works. You, I mean, you can't convince me that I, 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 there are extremely few people who watch this movie who did actually want that family blown up. That's just not, you know, you don't want to see those kids die or the wife. And I mean, certainly if the DHS at least give him a chance, like if, if it were like a duel or something, but it's, it's really, you know, they're just going to blow him off. They're not going to give him a chance to fight back, you know. And, although, on the other hand, back when people did duel more, a lot of people dueled, and a lot of people died dueling. So, maybe that is, yeah, let's, let's not bring back dueling. Or, let's make it that duels have to use non-lethal weapons. So, that, like, if, if you want to settle a dispute and you're just going to use, like, paintball, you know, I, I feel like that would be a, a perfectly decent, yeah. Let's see, so, uh, right, I, I saw at least one person saying that given how Jackson... Uh, let's see. Right, the, yeah, the fact that Jackson, near the end of the movie, keeps chasing Lisa and trying to kill her, it's hard to believe that he would have gotten this far. You know, we're, we're told, you know, this is not his first job. You know, he's been doing this for a while. The way I see it, he's basically never faced this kind of failure before. And it kind of broke him. That's why he keeps chasing after Lisa. He can't handle having lost. I, I believe that he's had similar experiences, but he's always been able to cut his losses. He's always been... Yeah. I saw this one person criticize that finding a rocket launcher from a boat at sea would be extremely difficult to do. Like, you know, like the aiming would be... Yeah. And I agree, that's 100% true. I'm not making any excuses for that. And I actually, I hadn't thought about that. But when I read it, it was like, holy crap, yeah. And, yeah. So I watched a bunch of YouTube videos for, for this. Doing, you know, searching for other videos, talking about Red Eye. So, one of them was this channel called Rewatched a Movie. It was a good video. I subbed to them from having watched it. I think I'm going to have to keep, it. you know, I recommend watching it. The, the, let's see, and then there's, um, yeah, I already talked about the 80s joke, and, yeah, so the, the, uh, yeah, that's, that's it for those. And so the, the DVD comes with numerous features. Okay, so let me see. I'm just going to... Yeah. Okay, so there's a commentary, and it is Wes Craven, producer Marianne Madalena, and editor Patrick Lussier. 
Craven is likable to listen to. Lisa and her father walk in the same direction when on the phone at the start, telling us he drives her action. She got her actions. She got her drive from him. Before Jack becomes a big part of the film, he appears subtly on the edge of the frame, gradually becomes a bigger character. Rachel wasn't expecting to get as much ice on her when it's spilled, so her reaction is completely real. I'm really glad that she managed to stay in character instead of being like, ugh, cut. Uh, you know, she, yeah. And, let's see. Yeah, and, and they point out, you know, she takes off her top and we see the scar humanizing her, even though guys were like, oh, she's taking her top off. And we should be able to tell Lisa hasn't had a drink with a guy for two years before with Jack. And he didn't know about the rape. That's why he couldn't account for it and why she can fight back in the end. And when they start talking about what he wants her to do, it almost sounds and looks like a couple arguing. She pushes back right away, including not drinking the water he offers her. The side characters start out minimal, got a little bigger because he liked them. And yeah, when Lisa says, what, you don't have a backup plan? She and we realize that he's under pressure. And there's some false affection right before Lisa leaves for the ball bath. Oh, sorry. The headbutt made it look painful for Jack too. When they're talking in the bathroom, she goes from an adult to a child. They live in the bathroom, and she has, yeah, and now she has weapons. She has to find the exact right time to use. They wanted to have the movie done before flight plan, so they edited it on four days, which they confirm is extremely quickly. And, yeah, and, and Lisa says, you promised. And, again, it's like if they were a couple. And she become, you know, she, uh, let's see, yeah, she realizes that she sold her soul, you know, that the family is going to die. He becomes, let's see, yeah, he, oh, that's also when he becomes aware just how bad it is, but he doesn't change his mind. And she realizes that she has to prevent him from talking to the killer near her father and he's talking about coffee and his calm he's certain it will succeed and she's his accomplice there are a lot of cameos while the boat is being searched for weapons when she talks about rape the close-up of her eyes is actually from between takes and she's like in reality she's like saying okay so back one or something like that you know but they thought it was such a great shot, and you can't see her lips, so it's easy to dub over it. With and and as far as I understand, the lines they dubbed over were shot on set. They did so, and that's why you can't tell that it, it's it doesn't sound like ADR. It was difficult to censor him being stabbed in the throat to keep the PG-13. They filmed in three different airports when they filmed phone calls. Uh, yeah. At first, she called her father, then the hotel, but then they changed it in editing. Frequently, an explosion will lead to a lull. Here it happens after she drives the car into the guy. At first, Jack wouldn't talk at the end. Then he talked more than he does now. Yeah. If you've ever worked on a movie, it goes back and forth. Like, it, you... What... You, the, the final movie only becomes the final movie by the time everything has been written, filmed, and edited. It changes a lot along the way. The end has her fighting on home ter territory because he followed her there. They had thought to make house a dad, sorry, dad's house a divorce house he moved into, but decided to have it be the house she grew up in so she knew every area of it. By the time he jumps out in the house, we're on edge because so many places he could have been hiding where he wasn't. Rachel was a figure skater, so she had great coordination and balance, hence fighting off Jack. Jack said something right before dying, but they felt a look was more powerful. They had to show Cynthia at the end, too big a character not to. They had different versions of what Lisa said to the awful couple at the end, but what she did say had the best payoff. Audiences didn't feel it was short, same for critics. They got thanks for the duration. The TV version had four and a half minutes put back in. It was hard to find anything to put back in. One scene with Dad, and there was little else. 
and they worked with someone young who had seen Craven's older films when he was a kid. People loved the film, family and friends of people making it. And so, I it's too bad that the DVD doesn't come with other op, uh, you know, other things she said to the 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 people there at the end. But then, I mean, you know, the longer you spend on stuff like that, the more expensive it's going to be to put out the DVD. So they, you know, they did the stuff they already had and then they you know they shot some interviews and you know recorded commentary and such and such okay uh i guess yeah i think i'm gonna skip but the yeah for for those wondering there's like the making of red eye which is 11 and a half minutes was craven new kind of thrill which is 11 minutes both are featurettes they're good and okay so i am going to talk about the gang grill at least briefly so it's six and a half minutes which craven and his wife have a cameo at the airport they're like doing crosswords and he tries to cheat by looking at hers and there are several outtakes of that because she pulls away too slowly for you know and and like you know he's he's sitting there trying to do his and he looks at hers and like he'll look at hers and then like a second later she'll pull away and he'll be like, well, no, I just love me. And, and just, you know, he's he's not like badgering her about it, but it's just, they're, they're such a couple. They're, they're so, like, she's like, I, I thought I was doing, you know, it's like, yeah. They're, they're, it's not like a big argument. It's just, a, you know, it's a tiny little bit. Yeah. I love gag reels. They are so humanizing. And the, the you know, 11 year old girl has several really funny, I, I think, yeah, two major outtakes. Where she's like really intense and threatening, like you know when when her mom says, you know, yeah she like her mom says, are you are you fine? And she says yes. Are you sure? And in the movie she just says, I'm sure or you know something like that. But in in the outtake she's like, she she like gets really intense and she says, mother, don't make me hurt you in public. And just and the other guy, uh, sorry, the other time when. You know, she walks up to, like, the, the, let's see. Uh, yeah, I guess I, yeah, I'm not 100% certain exactly when this happened. But, like, she walks up to, to Jack and Lisa, I guess, right outside the bathroom. I guess this is supposed to be when they leave the bathroom and the stewardess says, not a motel, you know, she walks up to them and she's like, is this guy bugging you? Because I can take him out in the New York minute. It's just... Yeah, she's she's scary convincing about it too, and 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 Sheila has several really funny outtakes. You know, he grabs her scarf, and you know what's in the movie is that's my scarf. And then she goes on to say, "I thought you liked me. I wouldn't stab you in the neck. Are you gonna say cuts?" <laughs> and yeah, the last bit was to to Craven, and. Yeah, and then there's a bunch that are like people tripping, missing cues and such. And that bit where they're supposed to be just a little, like a, a single drop of blood on Jack's head. You know, that like there's like a lot of blood on his forehead. It's like, okay, <laughs> gotta, yeah, gotta, gotta remove the blood and, and start over for them. And there's an outtake of turbulence where at least one of the people are saying like, swing low, sweet chariot. And... I think it's at first one and then others join in and some of the others are like, this isn't a musical, stop that. And, okay, so I'm going to try to finish this off really quickly, really soon. Criticize IMDb and Wikipedia. So I have a bunch noted. I'm just going to go through the most, okay. Skimming, skimming, skimming the Blackwater Bay, washing the something, something away, and let's see. Yeah, and so there's uh, there's only one tagline on IMDb: "Fear takes flight." And let's see if I can. Ah, uh, fear takes flight. 
yeah, I th my my DVD cover has this. I guess it translates to you know tra traveling with fear or fear on board the plane, something like that. And let's see. Yeah, there's some really good stuff in the IMDb trivia. Yeah, apparently the film was written for Sean Penn and Robin Wright, and then Craven opted for younger leads. I really like that it, like the fact that, uh, ah, I do think that they could have done it, and they would have been great as well. But the fact that Killian is so young, you know, that makes it so much creepier. Like, I mean, when he's, he says at one point that he killed his parents, and I'm like, maybe. Like, he, I, there, there's some chance that, like, he was a teenager, 20-something, and he killed his parents. For, you know, just, yeah. And, let's see. Right, and other, yeah, so actors that were considered Nev Campbell, Amanda Peet, Rachel Weiss, Robin Wright, Jennifer Connelly, and Claire Danes. I think all of them could have, but I'm really glad that it was, you know, it, it, was, a, it was a career boost for Rachel McAdams. And I'm not sure those other actors needed that career boost. And, yeah, so, uh, Jackson could have been played by John Travolta, Nicholas Cage, Kevin Bacon, Willem Dafoe, Michael Pitt, John Malkovich, Edward Norton, and Ray Liotta. So, again, yeah, they could have done it as well. I feel like John Malkovich, he, he would have ended up just playing this. I, I mean, honestly, I think he would have ended up playing it essentially like Cyrus Grissom. And I, th I feel like that might actually cheapen the impact of watching Con Air, which if you haven't, you should, because it's an amazing movie. Let's see. I think Willem Dafoe might have been a little bit intense. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the rest, again, I'm really glad, you know, Killian Murphy, it helped really make, you know, it's a much bigger role in this than in Batman Begins, so it also helped his career. And let's see. Hmm. Okay, so there's Yeah, there's some really good points in the goose section. So yeah, what I will I'll I'll finish this off by saying that the yeah, there are 717 IMDb user reviews for it. So, you know, thankfully a bunch of people cared about cared enough about it to to review it. And if you go to the excuse me, IMDb external reviews section. I mean, I th th there are 225 total. I was only able to copy in 72, so the rest are dead links, languages I don't speak, and, and that kind of thing, so, yeah. And that is, yeah, that is it. So, I hope you enjoyed watching, as I enjoyed watching and reviewing, and I'll catch you next time.